Well, good evening and welcome to Copernic Observatory and Science Center's Winter Star Party 2021. Uh, my name is Drew Desker, I'm director of the Copernic Observatory and we're so glad to see you here. Um, we've got a nice uh, nice program with a, a range of, uh, of uh, material for, for a range of people. And um, so let me just give you a, a very quick um, outline of how today is going to go. Um, so starting, you know, starting right now, I'm uh, starting with a welcome and I'm going to give you a little, little bit of background on the Copernic Observatory, a little background on Copernic himself. And uh, again, sort of focusing a lot on uh, what we do up here at Copernic, uh, what we've done over the, uh, over the last year or two. And um, what we hope is that um, uh, uh, you get a sense of uh, a flavor of, of uh, what even a small uh, science center can do. Uh, so then we'll continue on to about seven o'clock where we will uh, have our first uh, keynote speaker and that's uh, Bob Naya. And Bob was the uh, former Sky and Telescope uh, Editor-in-Chief and he's going to be doing a talk about the mysterious SETI signal from Proxima Centauri that was uh, picked up by an observatory in Australia back in 2019. And uh, I'm sure he'll have uh, uh, some really interesting stories about that and, and also some, some little philosophical uh, uh, aspects of uh, his talk will, uh, I'm sure he'll be focusing on, like, uh, should we in fact uh, answer back? Uh, should we take that call? Then right around um, 750 to 7.55, we'll take a little bit of a bio break. And uh, so everybody can uh, get up, stretch their legs, uh, do whatever you need to do. Uh, then at 8 o'clock, we are going to be celebrating the 548th birthday of Nicholas Copernicus, Nikolai Copernic. Um, he was actually born on this day, uh, February 19th in uh, 1473. So we'll uh, light the cake. All right, well, we'll light the candle. Uh, hopefully the cake's not that flammable. And um, sing happy birthday to him. And if you haven't already uh, uh, had your dessert, hold it and uh, uh, make that uh, part of your dessert time uh, when we uh, celebrate uh, Copernic's birthday. Then right after that, uh, we have uh, Dr. Linda French, who uh, is a uh, professor emeritus from Indiana Wesleyan University. And she's gonna talk about um, uh, her work as a astronomer and ultimately um, uh, focused on ground based uh, or her, her talk is going to be on it's called eyes on distant asteroids studying space rocks with ground based telescopes and dr french uh, that was part of what uh, her life's work was 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 chasing after these asteroids uh, there's actually an asteroid named after her and uh, dr french uh, actually went to uh, grad school uh, just up, at, up the road in Ithaca at Cornell and uh, got her PhD there and was a teaching assistant for Carl, Dr. Carl Sagan. So uh, maybe she'll even uh, tell us a, a Sagan story or two. Anyway, um, what I'd like to do now actually is just sort of transition to, uh, oh, before I, did, before I transition, um, uh, I also got to mention to you that uh, again, normally we would have uh, yeah, you know, a full, uh, the whole auditorium here and, and uh, things for families to do and uh, so in lieu of that uh, we are giving away not one but two uh, Copernic family memberships uh, and a Copernic membership is actually pretty valuable because uh, we belong to what's called the ASTC the Association of Science and Technology Centers it's a group a consortium of science centers throughout the world but um, primarily concentrated here in the US that uh, share membership uh, uh, benefits so a Copernic membership can get you into the Franklin Institute for free, can get you into the uh, Intrepid down in New York City uh, for free. Uh, anyway, we are going to be giving away two of those uh, memberships, and uh, if you haven't already signed up, there's a way to register for that. I'm going to go to my uh, website. And um, so if you go to the website, go to the home page, and uh, scroll down a little bit, there's this uh, post right here, the Winter Star Party, just click right up on here and you can do this in, in another tab uh, so you can you can hear the presentation while uh, while you're registering and then you scroll down here and we you know we talk a little bit about what's going on 
But anyway, here is where down here it says enter here if interested, and it'll take you to a Google form. Put in your information uh, real quick, and, um, and we ask you just register once. And, but you also need to register by 7 p.m. today, uh, just before uh, Bob starts his talk. And then sometime later in the evening, uh, we will uh, pick two names out of a out of a bowl, and uh, those will be the two people, uh, the two families that will uh, will get the free membership. If you already have a membership, you're eligible, and we'll just renew you for another year. Uh, but you have to be around when we pick the name. So, uh, so hang on. There's this again a lot of good stuff uh, that's going to be happening this evening, and. Um, so uh, the registration again will close at 7 p.m. for that. All right, um, let's see here. I'm going to start to I think transition over to my uh, my presentation about Copernic, and um, we'll uh, we'll take it from here. Uh, and that'll take us right up to about seven o'clock. So give me a moment. Let me bring out my presentation, and uh, here we go. Just size some windows here. Uh, and so I know what I'm talking about and here we go all right so again this is uh, the Copernic Observatory we're located on Underwood Road in uh, in Vessel uh, and we thank Drones Over Broom um, a local uh, gentleman does uh, some just fantastic drone photography and he seems to really enjoy coming up here to Copernic and we enjoy having him. He takes, he's taking some great shots, uh, great shots for us. So um, again, my name is uh, Andrew Desker. I go by Drew. I'm the executive director here at Copernic, and um, that's my email address. But let's uh, let's move on. So Nikolai Copernic is also known as Nicholas Copernicus. He was born in 1473 on this date and died in 1543 at 70 years old, um, and He's what we call the father of modern astronomy. This painting was by uh, Jan uh, Mataiko, I think, it was uh, and it called uh, Conversations with God. Uh, born today in, in Turin, Poland. In 1491, he entered the University of Krakow and he studied mathematics and art. Um, he didn't study astronomy, however, um, but he developed a great interest in space and started collecting books on the topic. Uh, then in 1496, he uh, went to the University of Bologna in Italy and studied canon and civil law. And 1500, actually studied medicine at the University of Padua. So uh, he was um, uh, quite, <laughs> quite the uh, Renaissance man before the Renaissance and um, uh, extremely, extremely intelligent man. He eventually returned to Poland to care for a ma family member, and ultimately there he started his work on the heliocentric. Um, uh, planetary system that uh, he is ultimately known for. Uh, in 1510 he moved uh, to Frambourg and uh, to the uh, cathedral there and actually in 1513 uh, built his own observatory and you got to think a little bit about this. This is before telescopes were even invented by Galileo uh, some 70 or 80 years later uh, at least. So um, he ultimately um, basically found himself, uh, made himself an observatory that he could observe the stars and start doing his work on developing the theory of heliocentrism. He eventually completed that work in 14, uh, 1543 in Nuremberg, Germany, and uh, well, it was published in Nuremberg, Germany, and it's called On the Revolutions of Heavenly Spheres, and uh, it's, been, it's supposedly said that um, he sort of got the first printed copy of it literally on his deathbed and died the next day. So. Um, and, and unfortunately, for uh, well, for many years, many hundreds of years, uh, uh, people really thought uh, uh, Copernic was a heretic and uh, really didn't believe in this in this science. But ultimately, uh, science prevailed. Uh, he is in, he is in fact buried in Fromborg uh, Castle in uh, a cathedral in uh, in Poland. And actually, for a time, his uh, uh, remains were not exactly known. And uh, there were multiple. Uh, instances of trying to find his remains. Eventually, in I believe in 2004, they confirmed what his remains were, and then finally reinterred them. And, and now this uh, uh, is his his permanent grave marker. And of course, there is a Copernicus crater on the moon named after him. So now let's uh, 
turn to uh, Copernic itself. And um, uh, so ultimately, uh, back in, in, 19, in the early 1970s, there's a group of Polish immigrants, people of Polish heritage, here in the southern tier of New York that wanted to commemorate Copernic's 500th birthday. And rather than buy a statue, plunk it in the park, they said, let's do something with it. And so they built the original observatory. Um, the man on the left here uh, in the red jacket is Dr. Ed Kozlowski, uh, one of the founding members of the Copernic Society. Uh, Richard Miller was a uh, uh, legislator for New York, uh, also a member of the Copernic Society. Uh, uh, Richard Kelsey was the architect, um, and Ed Neslick was the contractor. Um, now this man in the uh, black jacket uh, may be familiar to some of you if you look at his face really good. Uh, he's Commander Jim Lovell. Commander James Lovell of Apollo 13. This was two years after his Apollo 13 mission. And he came up to actually uh, uh, help us set the cornerstone for the Copernic Observatory. So this is what it looked like back in the uh, early 70s, just a, a single classroom and, and uh, another building with, uh, with two domes. It was then donated to the Robeson Museum and Science Center, downtown Binghamton, and they ran it um, for about 33, 34 years. Uh, in the 1990s, they had a major uh, capital campaign and expanded it to the way it looks today, uh, expanding that physics classroom, is, is uh, that original classroom is this little area over here, and uh, this is our main building, and these are the two original domes, and part of the expansion was to add our third, uh, third dome. In 2007, uh, Robeson decided uh, they needed to focus on their main business and uh, uh, offered uh, the Copernic Observatory back to the Copernic Society, and we took it. So we, st we use it as an informal STEM education uh, facility. Uh, for those that have been up here, or all more specifically, for those who have not been up here, uh, we'll show you we got three in those three domes that you saw uh, earlier here, those three domes. We've got uh, three permanent telescopes. Um, one is a six-inch uh, astrophysics refractor. Uh, we use this primarily for looking at uh, planets uh, at the moon, and when we put a solar filter on, we'll, we can uh, safely look at the sun. Uh, this is a 14-inch uh, reflecting telescope by Celestron. It's a 14-inch Edge HD um, reflecting telescope, and this is uh, we use this for a combination of both uh, planetary as well as uh, deep sky. And um, when we do some of our live streams, uh, uh, observing live streams, we use both the 6 and the 14 for this. And then finally, we have a 20-inch um, a uh, Ritchie Crichton reflecting telescope made by Optical Guidance Systems out of uh, the Philadelphia area. Uh, this is also known as the Kresge Telescope. It was uh, funded by the Roger Kresge Foundation. And uh, this scope is really, we used to use it actually for observing. I recall coming up here in the late 80s and actually uh, looking at Halley's Comet uh, as it was leaving, uh, <laughs> leaving us. But uh, this scope was really designed to be uh, an imaging scope. And so uh, again, through the Kresge Foundation, they founded a uh, uh, imaging system, a camera system that allows us to take just phenomenal uh, digital imaging. So uh, this scope is now uh, permanently uh, an imaging scope for us. Now we also have another scope that we added recently, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, a little later, but this is uh, part of the Copernic Science Park, which, uh, and we wanted to make the, uh, as a playground and that uh, we built, but we wanted to uh, make it accessible to people, and in particular, to get to our, our regular domes, you have to negotiate a set of stairs, and not everybody can do that. And so we talked to a, a telescope maker, uh, uh, Ryan Goodson, and to make us a scope that is uh, accessible by a wheelchair. And so the eyepiece is actually right here in the middle and rotates at that point. So no matter whether you're looking straight up at the zenith or at a, at a, at a horizon, the eyepiece never moves and uh, has been a great resource to us. So let me move on a little bit to the um, uh, next piece that I was going to talk about was the uh, Copernic Science Park. Um, Back in 2014, I reached out to a, uh, a group uh, called the Junior, the Junior League of uh, Binghamton, and uh, you know, I, want, I wanted to talk to them. I said, you know, look, science and engineering is literally everywhere we look, uh, and why not find a way to, to uh, convey that to kids when they're playing? 
it would be a way to turn you know play time into uh, you know discovery and learn time. So uh, before we got started on this project, when we had uh, students come up for camps or whatever, you know during break time they'd go outside and all we could really offer them would be uh, you know these frisbees or Nerf footballs and. You know, um, not everybody was into that. Uh, I swear, this was not a staged photograph. This was, <laughs> this was a, a student that just didn't want to participate in uh, that particular activity, and, and I said, this, "We got to do something better." So when I, we teamed up with the Junior League of Binghamton, this fantastic group that's been around for over 85 years, and uh, they chose our project, and we turned it into the Copernic Science Park. So um, we then engaged a, a local landscaping term. Uh, uh, firm to uh, do an initial design for us and then we um, went out to bid and finally uh, uh, this was our, this is Irene Sidlarczyk our most recent uh, uh, president she was president at the time uh, signing the con uh, construction contract and we started this is what I think this is what things look like now if you notice over here there's a bunch of these orange cones we had a, a natural spring that actually came up here and actually turned this into a bit of a, of a swamp which was a really a, a liability and We'll show you what we did with that. We did, uh, of course, like every construction project, always ends up starting in the um, on a rainy day, but we started nonetheless. And uh, there was a significant amount of earthwork, and part of what that earthwork was to do was to get rid of that uh, or to channel that spring into a resource to us. So, now, so down over here, this little brown area right here is actually a pond that we now have as part of the Copernic Science Park. So we kept building and building and doing a lot of earthwork. Uh, we even wanted to, uh, again, promote uh, sustainable uh, life. And so we actually have a compostable toilet. So uh, uh, in the spring, this will be commissioned and will be used as a, as a, a toilet that is available to people even when uh, our main building is not open. We even partnered with uh, students in Binghamton University to build a bridge for us. And uh, it was a little funny because we told them, well, we need the bridge about this long. And so they built it. And it was well before we actually had our pond built. So normally you build a bridge to span an existing waterway. We built our waterway to uh, accommodate uh, our bridge. Um, this blue material you see over here is called a, a flexi pave. And it allows us to um, uh, go ahead and, and uh, allow people in in wheelchairs to, to navigate around and we often will bring uh, scopes out into this area and, uh, and so that's a nice service for them to, uh, to work on. Yeah. All right, let me see. I'm hearing I'm getting a little uh, echo here. Let me see if I can turn down something here and uh, let me try this. Hopefully that is going to work and you can still hear me. All right. Um, so uh, my little uh, monitors, if you'd let me know how that went. And uh, so anyway, we're gonna, let's press on here. Um, so then eventually we finally got, we're able to go ahead and uh, put in uh, the actual uh, playground equipment and you'll get a, a closer look at that here in a second. But again, we also needed to put that bridge up and uh, so we actually had to drain the, <laughs> drain the pond to put in the uh, abutments that would ultimately uh, hold that bridge up and uh, that we've got a nice uh, uh, safety surface for kids to fall on. And um, uh, one of the things we again wanted to do was we really wanted to help bridge the uh, playtime to learning time. And there was actually a Girl Scout, uh, an intern for us, uh, uh, Caitlin Sonnen, who uh, uh, was working on her gold award for Girl Scouts. And her gold award was to create all the signage for all of the, um, uh, all of the, structures and uh, so what the part of also what we did was uh, you give a little bit of information about this but then there's also a QR code so uh, kids or parents could snap that QR code and then sends people to our website and then they can learn much much more about the, that particular object so every object has one of these we have a uh, uh, an abacus that was funded by uh, M&T Bank the cliffside run where we sort of focus on energy uh, and exercise uh, there's our composting toilet. Uh, we even have a flower talk tube. These little, uh, this thing here is uh, where the kids will talk into one side and then goes through a long tube and uh, on the other side of the playground they can, kids can put their ear up to the other side and, uh, and listen to that. Uh, we have a, a global motion which is I think the only one of these in the Northeast uh, and it's uh, 
get to learn about, you know, they call it the global motions. We can talk about the rotation of the earth. We can talk about centripetal, centripetal uh, uh, force and, um, and other things like that. It's, kids love playing on this. Uh, of course, you got to have swings, and we made sure that we had swings that uh, could accommodate uh, different uh, age levels and, uh, and abilities. We even have a, uh, a little reaction table called the Pulse Table Tennis that uh, kids can play with each other. And of course, no uh, uh, self-respecting observatory playground would be uh, complete without a, its own rocket ship. And uh, so we were fortunate to be able to, do, uh, to put one of those in there as well. Um, and of course, a seesaw where uh, we, get, uh, we can talk about the fulcrums and, and uh, so you can put maybe one uh, slightly heavier child here and maybe two over here and still manage to balance out. And even a, a geodesic dome uh, called the Super Moon Climber and we get to talk about how architects will, might use this as an architectural uh, design feature. Uh, another Girl Scout project was actually a little library and uh, so they uh, uh, actually the <laughs> Uh, the sister of, of Caitlin Sonnen, uh, Mary Sonnen, and her troupe uh, put this uh, little library together. And so uh, uh, it's, it's been a great resource. Uh, people you know, take books and they leave books. And, um, and uh, so when they want to take a break from playing, they can sit down and read. We also had an Eagle Scout, uh, or a Life Scout working on his Eagle project, did a uh, Phases of the Moon. Uh, and there are eight of these things uh, indicating each, of the, each phase of the moon. Uh, they're inside of our gazebo, and there's a QR code that takes them to our website to show people um, a little more information about, uh, about the phases of the moon. We had really hoped to be able to do a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, in-person uh, ribbon cutting, but unfortunately, uh, due to the COVID, we couldn't, so we did it virtually. And so we had many of the uh, supporters and foundations uh, and individuals who helped us put this all together. And we had a virtual ribbon cutting. It was me in the park and my laptop. <laughs> but uh, it was still a lot of fun. And you can actually see that, uh, that recording on, uh, on our YouTube channel. So, and so speaking of that, well, we'll get there. This is uh, actually a picture taken by Jeremy Carty, our, our live stream astronomer, which I just love. It's, it's great, and if you really look closely, you can actually see the, uh, uh, a bit of the Milky Way in here. So we're really looking forward to uh, opening up in the spring, and, and hopefully this summer uh, we can get through this pandemic and be, uh, be ready to uh, and invite people up to play again. Uh, again, we, mar we closed back in March, and um, so but we wanted to stay connected people, so we started this YouTube channel and uh, have been doing live streaming. And so we, uh, if not every week, or, or try, try to make it very often, uh, still continue our live streaming uh, capabilities. Um, again, if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, you can, if you're not already subscribed to it, subscribe to it today, and then you'll have access to all of our uh, programs that we've done. Um, we even did one yesterday, and this is a picture of Perseverance, about hanging six feet off the surface of Mars. This literally just came down uh, late last night. Uh, we, we had about 160 people on that live stream. It was a lot of fun, and um, uh, so we will continue to do live streaming. We're finding it very useful, and um, so, um, in fact, we did, uh, Last summer, we did our, our uh, summer camps virtually. We had eight of them that we did, and including one even on virtual reality, and we had one called Welcome Aboard the ISS, where we actually had our kids talk to an astronaut on the International Space Station as it was flying by through the ham radio station we have here at, at Copernic. Uh, right now, we are doing a virtual after-school STEM club. It's a pilot program funded by the George and Margaret Mee Foundation. Uh, that are month-long STEM programs uh, after school for at-use risk, uh, at at risk youth, and um, uh, it's been going great. We uh, look forward to uh, expanding it, and we are hoping and hoping that uh, we can get this uh, pandemic a bit under control, so that we can actually do our summer camps in person this uh, this summer. So we'll have uh, camps for elementary school. We'll have uh, camps for uh, middle and high school as well. Uh, as we're sort of getting toward the end here of uh, my presentation, um, this actually uh, a parent who had come up and, and uh, had their child you know, playing on, on, the, on the park 
wrote to us and said, thanks for inspiring my little one. Today she said, when I get bigger, I want to fly real fast in a rocket ship to the stars. And that's, that's really what um, we hope to always be about, is that we can find a way to uh, inspire kids uh, to reach beyond where they think they can um, actually, uh, where, you know, well beyond what they think they could do. And uh, that's really what we're all about. So um, let's see here. I'm going to go back to uh, this right here. And um, our, our, our speaker, Robert Naya, is uh, waiting to get admitted. So uh, I think what I'll do here is, um, uh, let's see here. Just, seeing, see, just reading some of the comments. I guess we're we're doing okay, all in all. So, um, all right. So, why don't you um, take a moment, if you would, uh, go to the. Uh, you can go to our, our Copernicus website, and if you wanted to register for that uh, uh, free family registration, again, we should be uh, uh, giving out. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll some, throughout the night we'll be giving out uh, the uh, the membership. So uh, um, we're going to continue. We'll keep it open for another two minutes until uh, right about seven o'clock. So go ahead and do that. Meanwhile, I'll get uh, Bob Noya uh, all locked in here, and then we'll be back. So I'm going to send you back to our Stellarium uh, feed here. So see you in a bit. All right, uh, let's see here. I think. Uh, oh, okay. And Bob, can you give me a little audio? Yeah. Is this good? Okay, that's good. And I got mine, and we are back. All right, well, um, 
hopefully everybody's back from uh, whatever break they needed to take. And we are uh, going to start our uh, one, two, our first of our two um, uh, two presentations this evening. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, a friend of a longtime friend of Copernic, uh, uh, Bob Naya, and oh yeah, and. Um, he was uh, the former. Uh, he was the editor in chief of uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, and uh, uh, he presented last. Um, uh, hold on here. Let's see. Um, okay, I'm gonna actually hold on a second. I'm gonna turn off this because I'm told my audio is a little, a little crunchy. Oh, give me a second. All right. Um, so Bob, uh, Bob is. Spoken a number of times up here at Copernic, and um, always has some great, great uh, presentations. And this is one I've not heard before, so I'm certainly looking forward to it. Uh, and um, uh, so, Bob, I'm going to just turn it right back over to you, and um, we'll uh, we'll go. You know, uh, and what I'll do is I'll be uh, uh, taking keeping a list of questions for you, and uh, we're going to try to keep right on time so that about 7:55 people can take another bio break. And, um, and we'll go from there. So, Bob, it's up to you. Hey, great. Thank Drew Desker and Patrick Manley for inviting me to uh, speak to you tonight. And I want to thank everyone who helped to organize the Copernic Winter Star Party. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for tuning in on a Friday evening. Um, and even though I'm not going to be talking about Mars tonight, I do want to send out a hearty Congratulations to NASA and the Perseverance team for yesterday's successful landing on Mars. So tonight I'm, I'll be discussing whether or not we have picked up a radio signal from an extraterrestrial civilization. And making matters even more interesting, the signal comes from the direction of the nearest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri. So the story has gained a lot of traction on the internet, uh, and I wrote a news story about it for Astronomy Magazine's website. But I want to stress right off the bat that the signal is probably not from ET. But if we have picked up a signal from ET, it will raise a set of profound questions about whether and how we should respond and humanity's overall place in the universe. So I'm hoping this discussion will stimulate all of you to think about some of these issues. Okay, uh, the discovery was made possible by an ongoing research effort known as SETI, which stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So different research groups have been conducting SETI at a fairly low level since the early 1960s, and they mainly focus on ra using large radio telescopes like the one here to listen for radio signals sent by other civilizations. Um, now, radio waves are easy to confuse with sound waves, but I think as most of you know, they're entirely different things. So sound waves are pressure waves in the air or water, whereas radio waves are a form of light, just like x-rays, visible light, infrared, microwaves. So space is just filled with radio waves from many different natural sources, including normal stars like the sun, neutron stars, black holes, galaxies, and so on. So astronomers have built large radio telescopes to study these natural objects. Um, and you can see here in this diagram that radio waves are at the left, meaning they have the longest wavelength of any form of light. So in the late 1950s, scientists realized that radio is a relatively easy way for technological civilizations to communicate across the vast distances of space for several reasons. First, it's relatively easy to transmit powerful radio signals that can be detected at great distances, and it doesn't require extremely advanced technology to send or receive radio signals. And second, it's radio waves are a form of light, so they're traveling at the speed of light, nature's fastest possible speed. And third, as I'll explain shortly, 
civilizations can transmit radio signals in such a way as to make them easily distinguishable from natural radio signals produced by stars, galaxies, and other objects. Now the signal I'm gonna talk about tonight from Proxima Centauri was picked up by the most advanced SETI project in the world called Breakthrough Listen. Uh, it was funded by tech billionaire Yuri Milner, we see him at the upper, light, upper left, I'm sorry, and other investors who gave the project $100 million in 2015. So Breakthrough Listen uses both of these telescopes, one in the US and the Northern Hemisphere, one in Australia and the Southern Hemisphere. It uses other telescopes as well, but these are its two primary dishes. Pardon me, Rob? Could I just ask you to, uh, uh, people are saying that your audio is a little low and I've got, I got it tweaked up as high as I can make it. So uh, if you could just make sure you continue to project. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, okay, I have no idea how to. No, that just, okay. just, uh, just be aware of that, thanks. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, so the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia picked up this signal on April 29, 2019. Uh, the telescope was observing Proxima Centauri, trying to catch radio emission <clears throat> from powerful flares being shot off the star. These are flares even more powerful than solar flares. Uh, but then late last year, an intern on the team noticed an unusual signal that was buried in the data. So apparently the signal appeared five times each time when the telescope was pointed at Proxima Centauri for about 30 minutes, but when the telescope pointed in a different direction by about 30 degrees, the signal went away. Uh, so it's important to realize, however, that radio signals from other directions can occasionally leak into a telescope. But the team ran this signal through many different algorithms to filter out all sources of terrestrial interference, you know, human-made radio signals from things such as satellites, interplanetary spacecraft, airplanes, cars, and even microwave ovens. And the signal survived every one of these filters, flagging it as an interesting candidate ET signal. So the team is calling it Breakthrough Listen Candidate 1 or BLC1. Now, the finding was not intended for public con uh, consumption, at least not right away, but someone, probably a team member, apparently linked the st leaked the story to the British newspaper, The Guardian, which broke the story on December 18, 2020. Here you see their web, their web story. So articles have since appeared in Scientific American, National Geographic, New York Times, and many other reputable publications and websites. So the team has not yet published a scientific paper or posted any specific information on its website. So all we really know is what they've said to a few uh, media uh, outlets like The Guardian. So we don't know all the details about the signal. So the team is apparently working on two papers for scientific journals, and I do not know when they will be published. The team is basically hard at work on its analysis and has gone silent. Okay, now the team has not stated exactly how strong the signal was, but it was apparently relatively weak as it was received at the radio telescope. But what makes the signal interesting is that it was very narrow in bandwidth, meaning all of its energy was concentrated into a very narrow range of frequencies, like the purple spike we see here in this slide. Now this is important because when humans transmit uh, narrow band, we, or we like to transmit narrow band radio signals because it's efficient to pack all of the energy of a radio transmission into a narrow range of frequencies. And then as you can see in the slide, that narrow band signal will stand out against the background noise. So that's why you have to tune a car radio very precisely to pick up your favorite radio station. But in stark contrast, Mother Nature 
doesn't care about efficiency at all. So natural radio sources like stars and galaxies spread their radio signals across a broad range of frequencies like the red hump we see at the bottom of this slide. So as, as a result, there are no known natural radio sources in the universe that produce narrow band signals. So SETI specifically looks for narrow band signals because they strongly indicate an artificial origin. So whatever produced this BLC1 was almost certainly an artificial source, not a natural source. Uh, so the signal was detected at a frequency of 982.02 megahertz, which is 982.02 .02 million cycles per second. And I've indicated that frequency um, uh, at, at, on the bottom with that, uh, with that red arrow. Uh, so this is part of the radio spectrum that's not commonly used by humans especially our, our satellites and spacecraft, which makes the signal even more interesting. But on the flip side, you'll notice it's very close to an exact integer of 982. For example, it's not 982.35 or 982.64. So this argues against it being an alien signal, because why would the aliens use a human unit of measurement for their signal that you know you would figure they have their own units of measurement okay now the signal was also apparently monotone meaning it was a very simple carrier wave like the black wave at the top in other words the sender did not modulate the signal in amplitude like we see in the middle or in frequency like we see at the bottom which of course is how we produce am and fm radio so this means the signal was not encoded in such a way to convey complex information. But because BLC's narrow bandwidth and the fact it appeared when the telescope was pointing at Proxima and not when it pointed away, makes it what's probably the best SETI candidate signal ever since the Ohio State uh, Radio Observatory been here which we see at the lower right, picked up the famous wow signal on August 15, 1977. Now the wow signal got its name from the astronomer's handwritten note uh, on the computer printout that we see at the left. And uh, what it was doing is it was recording signals as you know zeros and ones with numerals, but this signal was so powerful and you can see this at the upper right. It went all the way up to the letters Q, U, and J in the alphabet. So this was a very powerful signal. Now there are no known, or there were, no known satellites or spacecraft in its general direction, and it lasted at least 72 seconds as the source passed overhead. It was in the constellation Sagittarius, but we don't have the exact coordinates of where the signal came from. Now attempts have been made to observe that part of the sky to see if we can catch a repeat, but it's never been known to repeat, or it's never been observed to repeat. So we probably will never know what caused the wow signal, but it does have all the hallmarks we expect from a radio signal from ET. Now sadly, uh, the Big Ear radio telescope was torn down in 1998 to make way for a golf course. So is this BLC-1 an extraterrestrial calling card? Now the, the project executive director, Pete Worden, uh, said uh, to Scientific American that he thinks there's a 99.9% .9 chance it was radio interference from a man-made source. And you can see from these tweets that he thinks it's radio interference. But it, you know, this is several months later and the team has still not yet announced a source. So until the team completes its analysis, it has a strong incentive to be very cautious in any statements it makes to the media. Uh, but note that other SETI efforts have occasionally picked up signals like this 
where eventually the team was able to you know, find out that it was interference. So my guess is you know, we don't know yet, but we'll probably know in the next few months. So I want to shift gears now and turn to the star, Proxima Centauri, which is the bright red star in the middle of this telescopic image. Now the stars in the southern constellation of Centaurus meaning we can't see it from the northeast U.S. But even if this star was visible from the northern hemisphere, it is a very, very faint star. Uh, in astronomers' lingo, it's 11th magnitude, meaning it would need to be about 100 times brighter to be visible to the naked eye. It only looks bright here because this is a, you know, an image taken through a telescope. So this uh, map, shows the distances to the sun's nearest stellar neighbors. But it's a little misleading because the stars are in different directions. And of course, this is two-dimensional space, it's three-dimensional. But you can see that Proxima is relatively close to us, only about 4.25 light years away. So remember though that a light year is the distance that light travels in one year, which is six trillion miles, so 4.25 light years equals 25 trillion miles. That's an enormous distance by human standards, but by galactic standards, that's very, very close by. Now Proxima Centauri is a very wimpy star compared to our sun, which explains why it is so faint to, the, you know, to us, even though it's relatively close to Earth. Its total energy output is less than 1% that of the sun's. And as you can see here, it's only about twice the diameter of Jupiter or Saturn. And it's about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the sun, which is why it appears reddish. Now, it belongs to a class of stars called red dwarfs, which one could argue that they are pathetic excuses for stars. But before I insult them too much, Remember, though, that they make up for that in numbers. They account for about three-fourths of all the stars in our galaxy. Another interesting factoid about Proxima is that it's estimated to be five to six billion years old, so it's a little bit older than the sun. So if there is a planet there with life, it's had plenty of time for that life to evolve into complex life or even intelligent life. So, Despite Proxima Centauri's diminutive size and feeble energy output, it indeed has a planet. I love this really cute cartoon. So the planet, known as Proxima Centauri b, was discovered in 2016. Now here's a speculative artist rendition of the planet in the foreground, and Proxima is the bright orange star to its upper left. Now it was discovered using a method called radial velocity, which is an indirect way of finding a planet. It basically discovers planets by how a planet's gravity tugs upon its host star. So this method is great at finding planets. It's found many astronomers using this method have found hundreds and hundreds of planets, but the method tells us almost nothing about the planet's physical characteristics. And unfortunately, the planet does not pass in front of Proxima Centauri as viewed from Earth, so we can't measure its diameter based on how much its starlight blocks. So about all we really know about this planet is it's, about, it's at least 17% more massive than Earth, and thus it's probably slightly bigger than Earth, and it's probably made most, mostly of rocks and metals, and it probably belongs to a class of planets known as super-Earths. We also know about its orbit. It orbits its star every 11.2 days at an average distance of about 1 20th, the distance at which Earth orbits the sun. So if this planet were in our solar system, and you can see in this illustration here, it would be well inside Mercury's orbit. So, you know, that, this is about all we really know about the planet. We don't know if it has an atmosphere, a magnetic field, volcanoes, oceans, moons. We know very little about it. But one thing we do know 
is that the planet orbits near the inner edge of Proxima Centauri's habitable zone. That means it receives about the same amount of energy from Proxima that Earth receives from the sun, meaning that if this planet has the right kind of atmosphere, it could have liquid water on its surface. So conceivably, this planet could support life very similar to the life we have here on Earth. But there's a working against the planet is its close proximity to a star. You know, Proxima is much less massive than the sun, but it's still a star. And that star's gravity is going to tidally lock the planet. That's what the calculations show. So the planet is, all, is what it means is it's going to revolve around the star in 11 days and also complete a rotation on its axis every 11 days. That's just like the moon around Earth. Earth's gravity tidally locks the moon, so we only see one face of the moon. Well, it's gonna be the same thing with this planet. It's always gonna show the same hemisphere toward the star. So that hemisphere is gonna be very hot. The other hemisphere is gonna be extremely cold because it's always facing away from the star. But think about it for a minute. If this planet has a thick atmosphere and winds, those winds could redistribute the heat and more or less equalize the temperature around the planet, or at least make parts of the planet habitable. And this is a beautiful piece of art uh, depicting this planet's surface. Now, you know, I think I've conveyed the idea here. Nobody really knows what it looks like but this is a reasonable, educated guess. So is Proxima B habitable? Is there life there? The truthful answer is that we simply do not know. Uh, now here's another artist rendition of Proxima Centauri, the big star at the left here, and the planet at the lower right. As I mentioned at the beginning, this star occasionally unleashes very powerful flares which bombard this nearby planet with high energy ultraviolet radiation and x-rays, as well as high speed charged particles. We don't know if this incessant barrage of flares strips away the planet's atmosphere and makes it inhospitable for advanced life. Uh, but if the planet has a sufficiently strong magnetic field and a very thick atmosphere, that could protect the surface so that life could start and evolve toward complexity. Making the system even more interesting, astronomers using the same radial velocity method very, very recently discovered a second planet, which we see here on the right, named Proxima Centauri C. And all we really know about it is that it has at least seven Earth masses and orbits the star every 5.3 years at about the same distance that Mars orbits the sun. <clears throat> so the artist here is depicting this planet as kind of a miniature version of Uranus or Neptune. So given its distance from a very feeble star, it's probably too cold to support life as we know it, but who knows? And we certainly also don't know if this system contains any additional planets that we haven't found yet. So how can we find out if this BLC1 candidate signal is coming from ET? So the Breakthrough Listen team is undoubtedly listening to the star with the Parks Observatory to see if the signal repeats. And they've already announced they're gonna repeat the exact sequence of observations on April 29, 2021, two years to the date that it detected the signal. And I have no doubt the team is looking at archival data to see if the signal appeared in past observations. And they're undoubtedly trying to pin down every conceivable source of human radio interference. And I suspect that they're also observing the star from other radio telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere, such as the Meerkat Array in South Africa. Unfortunately, the stars far, far enough south in the sky that it's unobservable to most of the large radio telescopes in the Northern Hemisphere. Still, I suspect 
we're gonna know the answer in a few months. If the team, for example, can identify a source of interference, then this ET hypothesis will die a very quick death. But if the team finds a repeating signal that won't go away, if they detect it at other observatories like Meerkat, or, and if they can like rule out every conceivable source of, of human radio interference, then the Breakthrough Listen team will have made the greatest scientific discovery in, of all time, a radio transmitting civilization only four and a quarter light years from Earth. So as I stated from the outset, the ELC-1 is probably human radio interference but it's going to be a lot more fun and interesting to speculate for a few minutes. What if it's a real, genuine extraterrestrial signal? That, that raises some really interesting questions. What should we do next? Should humanity respond? Who should decide how to respond? And if we do respond, how should we respond? And we have to wonder, who are they? What are their motives? Do they pose a threat to us? And what, if anything, do they already know about us? You know, these are very profound questions. The answers are far from obvious. And these questions would pertain to any ET signal that we receive, regardless of where it's coming from. But if there's an alien transmitter only a little over four light years away, we could send a radio signal that they would receive in four and a quarter years from now. And if they decide right away to reply, we, it would take four and a quarter years for their signal to get to Earth. So if they reply, reply quickly, we, you know, we'll get a reply to our message in less than nine years after our original uh, transmission. That's well within the lifetime of probably everybody or almost everybody uh, in this Zoom meeting. So what could be more exciting than the prospect of getting a radio signal from another civilization within your lifetime? So scientists, philosophers, linguists, and other influential thinkers have actually given very serious thought to the concept of METI, which of course is messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. So until this Proxima signal though, we've assumed that any aliens that we pick up a signal from would be hundreds or thousands of light years away. That would be a much safer distance, but it would also make two-way communication very dissatisfying because of the light travel time between us and them. I mean, we'd be getting a reply hundreds or thousands of years in the future when none of us are gonna be alive. So having another civilization only four and a quarter light years away is a game changer and would add urgency to all these questions I've been asking. Now, some of you might be wondering is, you know, have we attempted METI? And the answer is yes, but only at a rudimentary level. So in 1974, radio astronomer Frank Drake used the, the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, which we see in the middle here, which by the way, was recently decommissioned. He used Arecibo to transmit a message in the direction of M13, a large globular star cluster, 25,000 light years from Earth. So it's gonna take Drake's method, you know, 25,000 years to get there. And then the reply would take another 25,000 years to come back to Earth, so we won't get a reply for 50,000 years. And I don't know about any of you, but I don't plan to be around you know, 50,000 years from now. Um, so it's very safe to conclude, by the way, that aliens don't speak English. This isn't Star Trek or Star Wars. So finding a common language with ET is a major challenge, uh, but it's possible that we could establish a common language for communication because think about it for a minute. We share a knowledge of astronomy, radio technology, and mathematics. So Drake sent this three minute message in binary code, a series of like zeros and ones, arranged in 73 rows and 23 columns. 
73 and 23 are both prime numbers, and he sent this. He sent it at a frequency of 22,380 megahertz, but he shifted it a little bit during the course of the signal. So you can see here on the right, the the message does contain information about Earth, humani humanity, our biochemistry, the location of Earth within the solar system, and the Arecibo telescope. Now there have been other many attempts since, mostly privately funded efforts to send radio signals toward nearby stars. Now sending a detectable radio signal to Proxima Centauri basically involves hooking up a very powerful radio transmitter, much more powerful, for example, than a typical radio station to a large radio antenna in the Southern Hemisphere that that is something well within the means of many nation states and even wealthy individuals and organizations. But who speaks for Earth? You know, any response is not just a message for, from humanity. We have a responsibility to all the life forms with whom we share this planet. So I would think and hope that any decision to respond would be discussed at the United Nations and that people from many different countries and cultures would have a chance to voice their opinion. The problem is we'll never reach a unanimous agreement. After all, we can't even get everyone in our own country to agree on where, whether or not to wear a mask in public during a pandemic. So I would set the, the bar very high, meaning I don't think we should send a, a reply unless something like three quarters of the world's population approves. Uh, and then you also have to worry about rogue actors, you know, some you know, uh, wealthy individual you know, sending out signals on his or her own without permission from any governing authority. Um, and I would also argue that before responding, we should try to learn everything we possibly can about the aliens at Proxima Centauri. So for example, in the next decade, we could build a very sophisticated ground-based telescope like the one shown in this beautiful artwork that could study the planet in much greater detail. This one, by the way, is a concept called ExoLife Finder, or ELF for short. We could also build super sophisticated space telescopes even better than Hubble, and even better than the James Webb Space Telescope scheduled to launch later this year. That would give us a lot more information about this planet. Um, another thing we could do is use a crater on the far side of the moon to build a large radio telescope. The far side of the moon is the best place in the solar system to do radio astronomy because the body of the moon shields the far side from all the radio interference coming from in and around Earth. So with this, we can pick up very faint radio signals from Proxima Centauri, and if it's narrow band, we know it's not coming from Earth. So please note that it is incredibly improbable that humanity and the Proximans would reach the same level of technology simultaneously. So think about it for a minute. We developed radio technology about a century ago, only a century. So we have to assume that their civilization is more advanced and probably a lot more advanced. They probably have technology that has already discovered Earth and studied our planet's atmosphere with advanced telescopes, such as the one we're planning to build in the near future, and detected gases in our atmosphere like oxygen, water vapor, and carbon dioxide, they would conclude that there's probably life on this planet, uh, and they might even know, uh, you know that there's already a technological civilization on our planet. And that's possibly why, if this signal's real, they're sending radio signals our way to catch our attention. So it's possible that they know about us, they might know a lot about us, and they might be you know, monitoring our progress, seeing how we're doing. Uh, now they could be biological creatures like we are, 
or maybe they're machines running on artificial intelligence. Right now, we have no idea. Now, the late British physicist Stephen Hawking once said, quote, meeting an advanced civilization could be like Native Americans encountering Columbus. That didn't turn out so well. He also claimed that super advanced civilizations could be, quote, rapacious marauders roaming the cosmos in search of resources to plunder and planets to conquer and colonize. And for good measure, he said, quote, they will be vastly more powerful and may not see us as any more valuable than we see bacteria. Okay, now on the flip side, Carl Sagan argued in his Cosmos TV series that it's possible that advanced civilizations are highly enlightened and confident in their survival. After all, they managed to survive their own technological adolescence. So he's ar he argued that it would be mistaken to assume that they're hostile. They could potentially even help us by uh, helping us maybe cope with our own violent tendencies or the destructiveness that we're causing to our environment. So if these Proxima Centaurians exist, right now we have no way of knowing if they're friendly or hostile or perhaps just completely indifferent to us. But I, where, where I will agree with Hawking is that if they are hostile and far more advanced, we could be in grave danger. So there are numerous ways they could wipe us out. And this is not some cheesy sci-fi flick like Independence Day where humans successfully fend off an alien attack. You know, sorry folks, if the technological gap is just a couple centuries, we would have no defense. For example, they could accelerate an automobile-sized object to 99% the speed of light and smash it into Earth. The kinetic energy would be stupendous and it would quickly extinguish almost all life on Earth. And there's nothing we could do to prevent such an attack. We wouldn't even know it was coming, just suddenly got, we're gone. Another thing they could do is they could take a large asteroid and divert it so it hits Earth at a much slower velocity, repeating the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Or they could genetically engineer a deadly pathogen that would kill off all of humanity while leaving the biosphere intact. But I, I tend to think that at least for now, we don't represent any kind of threat to them, so they would have no incentive to attack us. And I think if we're being honest with ourselves, we have to admit that our biggest danger comes from ourselves with things like nuclear war, climate change, environmental destruction, being our primary existential threats. So I'm gonna spend the final two minutes discussing how Proxima Centauri's nearness has motivated the dream of interstellar travel. So the parent organization of Breakthrough Listen is called Breakthrough Initiatives, also funded by Yuri Milner. And for several years now, it's been planning to send a mission to Proxima Centauri called Breakthrough Starshot. And these plans predate the detection of this signal. So the idea is to build about a thousand tiny miniature spacecraft, attach them to light sails, and then use an extremely powerful laser to push on the light sails and accelerate them to about 20 to 30% the speed of light. At that speed, it would take these spacecraft several decades to get to Proxima Centauri. So here we see a design for one of these, what I'll call nano craft. Uh, and then think about it, even if almost all of them fail, there's a thousand of them. So if just a few of them make it, they can you know, collect data and send it back to Earth. So if BLC1 is a genuine ET signal, one could argue that we should send these nano craft so we can learn more about who we are dealing with. But one could also argue that we should not send this mission because anyone at Proxima Centauri could interpret these nanocrafts as a harbinger of more aggressive future missions. So consider this, 
we have been flying powered aircraft in our, in our planet's atmosphere for less than 120 years, and yet already we're contemplating an interstellar mission to Proxima Centauri. So this demonstrates that we're making rapid technological progress, and it suggests that interstellar travel is possible, especially between two planetary systems only 4.25 light years apart. It also suggests that you know if ETs are sex, sending radio signals from Proxima Centauri, they probably already, or they might already have a presence in the solar system, but one they're, they're trying to keep hidden from view. So uh, if I had to wager a lot of money, I'll, I bet that BLC1 will turn out to be human radio interference. And I think we're gonna know soon, probably within a few months, but in the slight chance that this is the real deal, a real signal from ET, humanity will face very interesting and important questions, and we can expect a lot of intense discussion at the international level in the years ahead. But even if the signal is not from ET, and that's most likely the case, questions surrounding METI and whether we should broadcast our presence to the galaxy are still fascinating because they force us to think about ourselves in a broader cosmic context. So I want to thank all of you for your attention. And here are three books I heartily recommend that touch upon some of these issues. And I also highly recommend these two movies Contact and The Dish. Uh, Contact is a movie specifically about SETI, starring Jodie Foster. Uh, the Dish is an Australian-made comedy starring Sam Neill about how the Parks Observatory relayed the radio transmission from Neil Armstrong's famous Apollo 11 moonwalk. Now, neither of these two movies are particularly accurate scientifically or historically, but they're both very interesting and a lot of fun. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. All right, give me a second here. I need to find my mute button, hold on. <laughs> I assume you can still hear me? Yep. Oh, come on. All right, and now I bet you can hear me. Yeah, no okay. problem. I was hoping to finish by 7.45, and it, it, I, I, I won that battle. You, <laughs> you, you stuck the landing. <laughs> exactly. <Yep. laughs> like, like NASA yesterday on Mars. Exactly, exactly. All right. Well, um, it's funny because I, I, well, first of all, I need to apologize. Uh, I thought I had my mic muted, and um, apparently people were hearing me cutting up the um, entries for our free uh, uh, membership, family membership. So, well, human interference. There you go. Exactly. But this is sound waves, not radio. Waves. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe it was uh, some right, some ET uh, making it sound like that. Um, all right. So let's see here. We got uh, questions. Um, let's see here. Uh, Skygazer says, uh, "What are your thoughts on the recently declassified footage of flying Tic Tac objects?" Okay, that is a very, very interesting question. Um, so, Tic Tac, or uh, Skygazer, is probably referring to the the Navy UFO videos. There's three of them, if I'm recalling correctly. One is from 2004, one is from 2015, and one is from 2016. Um, I don't know what's being shown in those videos. The Department of Defense last year uh, admitted, A, that those videos are authentic, and B, they don't know what they are. So uh, they don't know what they are. I don't know what they are. Um, you know, I want to leave options open for what they could be. Um, I, I, I'm very interested to know what they are. I wish the scientific community would take more interest in them. There is. An astronomer not far from where you guys are at SUNY, or a physicist at SUNY Albany, a physicist named Kevin Knuth, who is a very reputable physicist, 
and he has published a scientific paper based on the publicly available data in those UFO videos mm -hmm. that indicates that they're real objects flying at speeds and accelerations that are far beyond anything like in the human inventory. So I, you know, I'm just saying, I don't know what they are though, and I can't really say more than that because I haven't studied or seen other scientific analysis, but I would like to see not just Dr. Knuth, and I applaud him for doing an analysis. I'd like to see other military and civilian scientists get involved and try to figure out what's being shown in those videos. All right, well, you've just uh, pointed me toward somebody I should try to get for a Copernic. Uh... Yeah, and, and, and uh, Drew, I will, when this is over, I will email this paper to you. Okay, so great. It, it's an interesting paper. Let's put it, let's put it that way. It's a, it's a really interesting paper. Excellent, excellent, very cool. Um, let's see here, any other questions uh, we've got here? Um, again, a, a couple of people have said that, that your presentation was so thorough that you, whatever questions they had, you seem to have answered. Oh, okay. uh, George talks about pi times hydrogen is 3.1667 gigahertz. Not sure how that... Uh, yeah, yeah but, well, there, I think the, what he's referring to is there's all these different ideas about what frequencies another civilization would use mm -hmm. to transmit a signal that it wants other civilizations to pick up. Right. But uh, the, the, what the good news though, so for, you know, if you look at books from like the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s, you know, there was a lot of speculation about what frequencies SETI should listen to. And there was a lot of discussion, for example, about the water hole. And the signal from Proxima was not in the water hole, but close to these water hole frequencies. But that problem has sort of gone away because these modern receivers now that SETI uses mm -hmm. can literally listen to millions of very narrow band frequencies simultaneously. So that, that means we don't have to be particularly good at guessing or predicting what frequencies they would use. That's how one reason that SETI nowadays is much more powerful than it was several decades ago. Cool, cool. Uh, it was a follow-up question from uh, the same uh, person. Is the government supposed to soon issue a report on the un unidentified aerial phenomenon? Okay, well, you know, I don't really know. Uh, I, don't, I don't follow it that closely. I do know that a couple of weeks ago the CIA Apparently, or at least it claimed, the CIA was releasing all the data it has on UFOs. But from what I was hearing, people were complaining that it was released in a format that would make it very difficult for the public and media to really figure out what this data is. As for what the DOD is planning to do, um, I really don't know. Um, you know, I think that the military for a very long time has been encountering, you know, strange things in the sky that uh, we don't have an explanation for. Whether that's ET, you know, we certainly, you know, if we're gonna claim that they are extraterrestrial visitors, we need a very, very high bar to clear for proof. I don't think that bar has been cleared yet. Um, and I don't know if this is ever going to, re, you know, yield any fruit. Uh, but I will say there was a really good article a few months ago in Scientific American by two astronomers, basically saying that you know they'd like to see more scientific investigation of the UFO phenomenon. And I, in fact, I emailed both of them after I read it, saying I strongly agree with them. But I think we just don't know right now what is being seen and what, you know, when I have no idea what the government plans to reveal in the coming months. I mean, if they have more information, I would love, I would like to see them release, you know, more information. All right. Uh, we've got a couple questions that pop here. Uh, uh, Mike asks, uh, what do you make of uh, former if Israel Defense Minister uh, Haim Meshed's uh, Galactic Federation of Alien Statements? Have you heard, wow. heard of that? Uh, you know, I, I've read briefly about that. Um, 
here's an idea because I wanted to finish by 7:45. Yep. I took a slide out that I've given in other presentations. One idea, some some astronomers have said there's no way this signal could be from ET because why would the nearest civilization be the nearest star? That's incredibly unlikely. But there's an astronomer, another person that you guys should get for a future speaker at Penn State, at State, you know, Central Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. named Jason Wright. And he has, I think, an ingenious idea that if there is some kind of federation of, you know, planets out there, they would set up a radio communication network where it would relay signals from star to star, kind of like our cell phone networks. Like, Drew, if I call you up on my cell phone, mm -hmm. my signal's not going directly to your cell phone. Right. It's going from a tower to a tower to a tower and eventually to you. Well, you know, civilizations may be set up transmitters of lots of different stars. If that, in that scenario, we would only expect to receive a signal from a very nearby star like Proxima Centauri. Right. So if there is a federation of some sort, you know, we would only expect to tune in or connect from, you know, from a nearby star, especially Proxima Centauri. Right. Uh, let's see here. Philip says, when an alien civilization discovers us through radio, won't uh, be a, we, we be a massive uh, beacon of, of sources for them? And if we can't, if we, uh, this is, if we hear something once, can it almost be eliminated as another civilization? Well, I guess ultimately you know, we've got so much radio stuff going out there. How are they going to discern from that? And that's saying, of course, we're looking for a narrow band signal and a signal that repeats, and especially if the signal you know contains information that clearly, like for example, the Drake signal was 23 by 73. Mm -hmm. You know. You know, if we got like a string of pulses, zeros and ones, and it was a product of a prime number, or it was amplitude or frequency modulated in certain way that clearly indicates an artificial origin, and if we then you know, see it in multiple observatories, it repeats, that would be a clear sign that we've detected another civilization. All right. And I just want to mention, too, there's other ways to do SETI. Radio is kind of the easiest. It was kind of the first way that humans thought of of doing interstellar communication. But it doesn't mean it's the only way or even the way that if there are other civilizations out there, that's how they're doing it. And I want to make it clear, I'm agnostic on the question of whether other civilizations are out there. I would just argue we don't know. Right. We don't know. We could be alone, or there could be hundreds or thousands of other civilizations out there. We just don't know right now. All right. Well, uh, again, I wish we could have this continue on here, but uh, we did want to take a, a little break here before yep. we go into our next uh, our next uh, thing. So, Bob, thank you so much again for uh, for uh, joining us. Yep. Hopefully, next time we can uh, we'll have you here, and then uh, those questions can continue out into the lobby. That would be um, great, and I thank you and, and Patrick very much for inviting me. I look forward to the next talk. Excellent, excellent. And um, so what we're going to do is we are going to go take another uh, little bio break and um, be back uh, at 8 o'clock for um, all, all uh, we had, I think, 70, 74 entries for the, uh, uh, for the free membership. And... Um, so we'll see you back at the top of the hour.
And we're back. Welcome to uh, the second uh, half of the uh, Winter Star Party. Um, glad you could be here. One thing I forgot to mention is that uh, our Copernic live streams have been uh, very generously uh, supported by Broom Pediatrics. Uh, Dr. David Carter, who is actually in the in the chat tonight, uh, strong supporter of Copernic, and uh, and we appreciate uh, Broom Pediatrics' uh, support of our of our live streams and I uh, hope uh, you, you do as well. Uh, again, if you're new to uh, our live streams uh, and you like what you see and uh, are in a position to help us out, there's a, down in the description, there is a, uh, a way that you can uh, offer a, a donation of, 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 any, of any amount. The, everything uh, goes to uh, making, make, you know, continuing what we do here. So again, as we had mentioned in the past, um, uh, this is in fact Copernic's 548th birthday. And I don't know if you can sort of see it, but I do have a, a birthday cake with, um, I couldn't fit 548 candles on here. So uh, I was gonna need a much larger cake. So, uh, but anyway, so I think what we'll do, and uh, Linda, actually I, I, I've known Linda uh, for a long time, and uh, we actually met musically, singing. So uh, we're gonna sing happy birthday to, and we'll call it Nicholas Copernicus. Um, no, actually, we're the Copernic Observatory. We're going to call it Mikolai Copernic. All right, there we go. We'll pick a nice note, uh, baritone voice. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mikolai Copernic. Happy birthday to you. Woo! All right, and. Seeing as uh, how he's not available, we'll blow it out for him. And uh, during your presentation, Linda, I'll be uh, I'll be taking a, a piece of, a piece of that cake. Now, one of the things we had mentioned was that um, uh, we had offered a free membership to uh, people who registered uh, and being part of this uh, Winter Star Party. And so, what I did that paper cutting you heard earlier, and again, I apologize for that was me cutting up all the names. They're all folded over where I can't see the names. And I'm gonna pick out two names. Two, here's, here's one lucky person. And we're gonna pick out another one. And what we're gonna do is, if you, you need to be listening, but we need you to now email registration at copernic.org between now and 9 p.m. just so we know that you are we're watching. And um, if you can get, send, just send the email and then we will follow up with that, uh, with you from there. So um, our first lucky winner is Jennifer Paulus, P-O-W-L-E-S-S. -S. I apologize if I'm spelling, pronouncing that wrong. Jennifer Paulus is the first winner. And our next winner is Michael Nagorny. So Jennifer and Michael, if you would uh, at some point between now and nine o'clock send an email to registration at copernic.org. That's K-O-P-E-R-N-I-K dot O-R-G. And just say, identify yourself and we will arrange to get you your uh, membership. Um, if you didn't win, um, I'm sorry for you, but uh, I would also say that uh, getting a Copernic membership is actually again a very valuable thing. Uh, we belong to the uh, Association of Science and Technology Centers and with a Copernic membership you can get into over 350 other science centers for free uh, which is a great deal so you could go to the Franklin Institute down in Philly you could go to the uh, Intrepid down in uh, New York City um, I went uh, a couple of years ago down to the Franklin Institute just m myself and my daughter and uh, had we paid the the actual price it would have been more than the yearly uh, family membership of sixty dollars so uh, you can go to our website and um, uh, there's a link to, to show you how to get connected. Well, so let's move on to our pr presentation for this evening, our, our final presentation or our final uh, official presentation. Uh, Dr. Linda French is actually a, a, a friend of mine that I've known for many years um, when we were uh, both in Boston. Uh, she uh, studied uh, at Cornell University Astronomy, got her PhD there, and was a teaching assistant to Dr. Carl Sagan. Um, ultimately ended up in uh, Indiana and was uh, 
a professor of uh, physics in Indiana Wesleyan University, and uh, just recently, well, recently retired, you know, within a year or two, with Linda, was it? Yeah. yeah. And um, did some work also at, at a National Science Foundation. Um, and we are just very fortunate. I've been wanting to actually get uh, Linda connected up here at, at Copernic and looking forward to having her, uh, her speak more. Uh, so, um, Linda, we're going to take it over to you. I've got, uh, you should be able to present and, and uh, take it from there. Very good. <coughs> okay. Are we good now? You're good. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Drew. I am very happy to be here and following what you've been doing. And it's great to uh, have everyone here tonight. I'm especially delighted to be here on Copernic's 548th birthday. Uh, I will be talking about my work on asteroids and telescopes I have known and loved. Uh, but I also teach about the history of science. And I just wanted to, to share uh, a bit with you about that. In 2014, um, some of my students from Illinois Wesleyan and I, and by the way, it's Illinois Wesleyan, Drew. I know I came from Indiana, uh, and there is an Indiana Wesleyan, but actually the, the two universities always uh, end up fighting over a table uh, when they go to college fairs. So uh, it, Illinois Wesleyan is where I was. Uh, at any rate, we uh, went to London for a semester where we made use of all the phenomenal resources there in the city. And the University of London Rare Book Library was right down the street from us. And my students and I were able to go and make use of this phenomenal collection. They had both the first and second edition of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus. Uh, the students were actually able to handle the books themselves. Uh, I, I made up a list of questions since none of us spoke Latin or read Latin. It was, it was interesting, but we actually uh, found some very interesting things to address. And they got so into actually seeing the real thing themselves. Here, um, Don and Yamaya are looking at uh, the frontispiece to Johannes Kepler's Rudolphine Tables. We saw uh, a first edition of Galileo. It was just an incredible experience. And so it seems very fitting to me to be here tonight. But we are going to talk about both uh, observing and telescopes. Uh, so in particular, I'll be telling you about the telescopes that my colleagues and I have used. But of course, we use them for science. And so I'll be talking about the science we have done with those telescopes. And finally, I thought you might like to see what it's like to go on an observing trip to uh, a faraway place. That's not something that most people have any experience with. So that's how we'll finish up tonight. So the first thing you need to decide is what kind of telescope you need to use, which one, and what's most appropriate for your project. So here my colleague Bob Stevens, Larry Wasserman, and I are at the uh, Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. Uh, this is the largest telescope we use for our project. Uh, this is a four meter telescope, and you'll see it in person later on. So we use telescopes in Chile, Arizona, and Southern California, all adding something different to the project. Large telescopes like this one, uh, because they have such a large uh, diameter, and that four meters refers to the diameter of the mirror that gathers the light. So it's just like you using a bathtub instead of a small bucket to gather water. Uh, you can see faint things, which for galaxies means far away. For asteroids, it means small. And that was what we were interested in there. So you can see very, very faint things. But small telescopes aren't uh, as hard to come by as big ones. You can imagine that time on a telescope like this is very competitive. So uh, with a smaller telescope, you can often get a lot of time, sometimes even unlimited time. And those played a very important role as well. Now, we also used the telescopes at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. If you've never been there, I highly recommend it. It's a great trip. Uh, it's a very historic place. Percival Lowell uh, made his observations of Mars uh, with the telescope here on the left. That's a 24-inch refracting telescope. It's been restored beautifully. And when they're doing tours, it's, it's just phenomenal to see how well balanced uh, this telescope is. The uh, silver dome there that you see is one of the older buildings at the observatory. This was Lowell's office. Then the library. Now it's, it's just part of the grounds that you can visit. But there is a great visitor center with very modern, up-to-date exhibits. 
Uh, also, Flagstaff is the closest city to the Grand Canyon, and it's about an hour's drive to Meteor Crater. So there are many, many astronomical things to do there. Lowell also has an observing site outside of Flagstaff, and here Bob and I are at the 42-inch telescope there. So this is one of the intermediate-sized telescopes we used uh, for our run. And then Bob Stevens has his uh, own telescopes, and those of you with sharp eyes and who know about telescopes may detect uh, Celestron and or Mead telescopes here, a 14-inch and a 16-inch. Uh, the, this is a part of a consortium of astronomers who have their own telescopes there. They went to Home Depot and got the largest sheds they could without getting a, a building permit to put them in. And so they've very much done this uh, on their own. And it's a very impressive site. And having your own telescope has a lot to be said for it because you can get a lot of time and we needed it for this. So let's talk about uh, now the Oh, one more. Uh, it's also uh, a few miles from Joshua Tree National Park, which was a nice place to visit when I went there. But let's talk now about the science that we did with all these telescopes. And we're going to quickly review some solar system geography. Now, I know a few weeks ago uh, you had a talk from Alessandra Springman, a colleague of mine. And uh, please don't worry, I'm not going to inundate you with the same asteroid stuff all over again. Uh, I think the two talks will be fairly complementary because. She uses uh, radio telescopes to study near-Earth asteroids, things that come very close. We use optical telescopes to study distant asteroids. So hopefully uh, some will carry over, but mostly will be uh, slightly different. Okay, so just an overview of uh, geography. Uh, the inner solar system, which is where we are, uh, is here, and you can't see much detail here. Then we get to the giant planets, the outermost orbit, of course, being Neptune now. And the object formerly known as the planet Pluto is out here in what's called the Kuiper Belt. All these little dots are uh, nearly schematic, but one of them in indeed would represent Pluto. If we zoom in a bit, uh, now we see the inner planets here. And outside the orbit of Mars um, is the main asteroid belt. Um, it's not as constrained as this exactly. Yeah, that's where most of the asteroids are. Uh, the outer part out here by Jupiter is not very well populated, and we'll be talking about why uh, a little bit that a little bit more. But uh, when we get out here, now we're getting to the asteroids that we have studied. Well, here's a uh, collage showing uh, the small bodies of the solar system that we have visited with spacecraft so far, uh, mostly asteroids, and these are to scale. The smallest one I know this this is one that Alessandra talked about, Bennu. You can barely see it there where my cursor is. It's about a quarter of a mile across, and we'll be getting samples back from that. Uh, the, the, the encounter has uh, not happened not that long ago. We'll be talking about these two asteroids, Eros and Matilda, coming up. And I'm just going to point out that down here, some of the smaller objects on here are not a, a, what we call asteroids, they're what we call comets. And one of the underlying themes here is that there may not be all that much difference between what formerly we thought of as two different classes of objects. Okay, so what are asteroids? Well, here are four different types of asteroids. We get clue, or these are, sorry, these are meteorites. Uh, we think they come from asteroids, and I'll show you how in some cases we make that matchup uh, more as we go along. We study here these, and these of course, since we do have the meteorites in hand, we can uh, study them in the lab. We can study the way they reflect light. If we need to grind them up to get smaller particles, we can do whatever we want with them that we can't do with the asteroids. We believe, and this is why they're so important, that they are fragments of the early solar system. In fact, this particular, the one at the upper left here, called a carbonaceous chondrite, uh, we have uh, a lot of these now. And when we do radiometric dating, with uh, radioactive isotopes, we find uniformly, we get an age of about 4.6 billion years. Uh, this is the time since the rock was last molten and then it's solidified. So we take this to be the age of the solar system. So our current belief about the way the solar system formed, uh, this is an artist's uh, conception, a lot of cloud of gas and dust rotating around what would eventually become the sun. 
And eventually, as things began to cool off, these things began to stick together. And they formed what we call planetesimals. You can think of these, if you like, as first generation planets. They're not the planets we see today. They would go on to collide, break up, and make the planets. And we see evidence for this also around other stars. Down here you see an artist's conception that looks very similar to what we had on the previous slide. And in the image above, this is a NASA Hubble Space Telescope image of a star with the not very memorable name of HD 141943. Uh, the star is blocked off at the center because it would be too bright. You wouldn't be able to see these two uh, wings going off to either side here. Those are dust clouds that are glowing uh, and hot. So we think we, this, the images bear out the theory, and the theory has helped to uh, help, helped us decide where we're going to look next for things. Well, we might possibly have, it's been suggested, uh, that this object, which is the second object visited by the New Horizons spacecraft after it left Pluto, might possibly be uh, and a leftover planetesimal in our own solar system. Uh, it's further away than Pluto, 40 times as, Pluto's 40 times as far away as the Earth from the Sun. Uh, you can see here it looks like two things have come together gently, collided, stuck together. Uh, the reason why this looks a lot different from a lot of the asteroids we saw is that there really are no impact craters to speak of. It looks like they're just some globs of stuff that, stuff that basically kind of clump together and maybe collided gently to make this object, but it may have been processed very, very little. So possibly this might be a planetesimal, an example, an example of one. Well, now one thing I uh, glossed over was when we were looking down in the solar system, it's basically all in one plane. It's one, it's flat. If you were to put all those planets on a tabletop, little balls representing them, they would lie on the table. And the asteroids might go up a little bit, they might go down a little bit, but they would still be pretty flat as well. But we know there are objects that live out almost at right angles. And this is another artist's uh, depiction of where most of the comets come from. This is called the Oort Cloud after the astronomer who first proposed it. From the, the observation that uh, many comets come in from basically above the North Pole of the, of the solar system or below. This yellow dot here represents all we saw before of the, uh, the solar system, the planets, and the Kuiper belt. And all of this here, we don't know whether this structure is really there or not. It makes a pretty picture, but uh, it's not certain yet. So the comets are out, uh, for the most part, further away. And the reason uh, why they look like this, this is Comet Hale-Bopp, that has always, been, has always been one of my favorite comets I've seen, uh, is that they contain a lot of ice water ice, carbon dioxide ice, and uh, things that would boil away in the inner solar system. Living out in the Oort cloud, they hang on to those things until they come into the inner solar system. And then they heat up, the uh, molecules escape, sometimes small dust particles escape, and so you get both reflective light and glowing light from the particles in the tail. Okay, now back to uh, this view of the solar system. Again, mostly flat, and your eyes are not playing tricks. Uh, those, those dots are moving. Uh, the, the green dots uh, represent the main asteroid belt. Uh, the dots, uh, the, the lines in here are the orbits of the inner planets. Uh, the red things in here are the uh, asteroids that come close to the Earth, the ones that Alessandro talked about. But, and it may be hard to see, and you might want to lower your room lights if you are having trouble seeing it because later on we're going to have some fairly dark slides as well. Uh, but out here, there's, I'm, I'm seeing a blue object uh, that looks, it just moved, uh, that looks, there it is, look, looks um, very close to the background. That's Jupiter. And up here I'm seeing a cloud of dark blue objects also moving, and a smaller cloud, but down here some of them are moving. And if I draw a line from Jupiter to the Sun to the middle of that cloud there, it makes an equal-sided or equilateral triangle here. And the same thing for down here. Sun, objects, 
Jupiter. This, don't worry, this will be illustrated more fully as we go along. Together, these two groups are known as the Trojan asteroids, which is a strange name, and we'll talk about why, why they have it. The leading group are called Greeks, and the trailing group are Trojans, but as a group, they're all called the Trojan asteroids. Okay, so why Trojans and Greeks? Where did the Greek mythology come in? Well, uh, you might have, you might remember there was a movie back in the 2000s uh, about Troy, about the war between uh, the Greeks and the Trojans. Uh, basically, Helen of Troy ran off with a Trojan. She was Greek, he was a Trojan. And the hero of the Greek forces that went to get her back was played by Brad Pitt as Achilles. The hero of the Trojans was played by Eric Bana. He was Hector. Uh, there was a, a massive battle. It went on for 10 years. And the stories uh, were told in the Homer's Iliad and Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, this has been an ongoing theme in Western art and literature. This uh, is a more classical view of the battle between Achilles and Hector, as uh, drawn by Ruben, uh, painted by Rubens here. Achilles wins. Uh, moving on, we see also Achilles here now tending to the wounds of his best friend Patroclus in war. This is an ancient Greek vessel. Okay, here's how they got that name. All asteroids get a number and then a name. So the first one discovered was Ceres, the second one was Vesta, and so they were very big on goddess, gods and goddesses and heroes and, and the like. The first Trojan discovered was in 1906, and that was 588 Achilles. And then very quickly, uh, Patroclus, uh, the friend of Achilles, and Hector got asteroids named after them. And it was realized that they were in these more distant objects out by Jupiter. So now we have a nice pared down view. And there you can see those equilateral triangles. If you're wondering how that geometry comes about, uh, it was discovered back in the mid 1700s, actually, by the, uh, the French mathematician Lagrange who was uh, developing some of the aspects of Newton's theory of gravitation. And he realized that uh, there was no uniform solution to what's called the three-body problem, where you have a really massive object, the sun, and a pretty massive object, Jupiter. And together, those two make up most of the mass of the solar system. Well, you can't, a, an object can't be at Jupiter's orbit just anywhere along here. The, the one place where it can be stable is at one of this point or this point. And there are three other points that are somewhat stable uh, along a straight line between Jupiter and the Sun. The ones that are really stable are these two, so they're called the L4 and L5 points. So here over here are the Greeks. Achilles is in this group. His friend Patroclus somehow got stuck in with the Trojans over here. And then somehow the Trojan hero Hector got stuck in over on this side. So there's a spy in each camp if you want to think of it that way. So nowadays, uh, We've been giving uh, names of Greek heroes to the, these asteroids and Trojan heroes to these guys. Um, the thing is, folks, that as of yesterday, there were about 3,100 uh, Trojans that were really well studied, and we think there are probably a million of them. There are not that many characters in the Iliad and the Aeneid, so we're running out of uh, classical names here. And I suspect we're going just to numbers before things are over. Well, why are these things interesting? And how did I get interested in them? I first started observing them actually as a, as a postdoctoral student. I thought they were, they were fascinating. And because they're very dark, they only reflect uh, somewhere under 5% of the light that hits them. And they're further away from the sun to begin with, so they get less light and they don't reflect much. Uh, at that time, the technology just hadn't been good enough to, uh, been able to be able to get much information about the Trojan asteroids. So I applied for some telescope time, I got it, and I went off to study them. And it turns out that they have lots to tell us about the solar system. Now we're going to look at one more thing that's interesting. This is another animation, and we're going to start it off, we're starting off looking at things from above again. And again, remember that almost everything else in the solar system is in a flat plane there. Uh, but partway through, this animation is going to switch, and you're going to be looking almost directly at 90 degrees to this. And you'll see the cloud, the red ones first, of the Trojans coming right at you. And you'll see, whoops, I always hit the wrong button. There we go. OK. So this looks like what we thought. Notice also they're not exactly at that point. They move around it. 
Okay, so now the red ones are gonna come around and you can see now that they're spread out. They are, their orbits are inclined to that plane called the ecliptic. So they can go pretty far above it and down below it. They can get up to 45 degrees above or below in many cases. So this is something else that's just really different about the Trojans that I didn't really realize at the time. Okay, we're gonna now cycle back to what these distant objects might be made of. And I'm gonna start with a very close to home example about how we can measure the colors of things and, and learn about composition. Um, consider a countertop made of black granite and compare it to another one made of pink marble. Now, granite and marble are not the same, made of the same minerals, but they're also very different in their reflectance and their color. Pink is sort of watered down red. So if you were to break this down into a spectrum, uh, into uh, all the different colors, I have not seen the spectrum of this, but I'm pretty sure that it would be reflecting more red light than blue light. Whereas the black one might very well be reflecting almost no light at all at any color or wavelength here. So we would see a difference, even if, if we didn't know what they were made of, just uh, looking at the way they reflect light. Same thing with meteorites. Notice these things, they're not bright pink, uh, but there are, there are some that, that are very dark. There are some that are uh, much lighter. This one's got a yellowish tinge, and that's a very interesting meteorite, but that's not this talk, it's a different talk. Um, so anyway, they do reflect light differently. Okay, this is not um, an advanced class on spectra of meteorites. Just notice here that we've got one column called asteroids. We have another column called meteorites. And down here I've labeled a, uh, along the x-axis. This is the blue end of the spectrum. This is the red end of the spectrum. And you can see that different kinds of asteroids and meteorites reflect light differently. For this top case, where there's a very sharp dip here, well, we can compare over here. And in fact, we can identify what exact mineral that is. And in a few cases, such as this one, we can actually say that these meteorites right here came from the asteroid Vesta, which is pretty cool, even though we haven't you know, gone and, and picked up a rock of Vesta. We, we are vir virtually certain that's where it came from. Same thing with some of these. It's, it's very beautiful the way we can uh, identify some of these things. Problem for the Trojan asteroids. The spectrum, when you observe their different colors, they don't look like any meteorites that we've got. So either we don't have them yet, or if the meteorites have fallen, they're just lying in somebody's driveway looking like a rock and we haven't recognized them. My bet is that we haven't gotten them, but that's another question. So we don't know of any Trojan uh, meteorites that have come. They do seem to uh, reflect more red light than blue light. And a colleague of ours uh, once referred to them as burgundy colored. So if you need, if you want to think about what it, uh, the color might be, well, uh, you might think of that. But they do look like the bare nucleus of a comet. When we can see a comet before it's developed a tail, it looks like a Trojan asteroid, at least in, in its, the way it reflects light. So going back to that burgundy color, uh, if you want to think about the color, that might be what it's like, maybe even a little bit darker. Well, so what do the, the, the bear, what does the bare nucleus of a comet look like? Well, here's one that the European Space Agency visited uh, back in 2014 when we were in London. I remember seeing these pictures. A lot of people call this the rubber ducky. Uh, this is Comet Cheryumov Gerasimenko. And in certain places, as this one came close to the sun, you could see that it was giving off some of the, the uh, gases, those ices that I mentioned, water ice, carbon dioxide ice, they were melting, escaping to space, and so starting to make a, a small tail, but a tail nonetheless. And just a reminder about comets and their beautiful tails, this was Comet Neowise last summer, uh, one of the great ones that we've been able to see lately. Okay, so there seems to be some possible linkage here between comets and uh, especially Trojan asteroids, they look somewhat similar. So, Let's talk about another way we might be able to figure out how what a comet and a Trojan asteroid have in common. 
Okay, I mentioned that we'd be talking about these two asteroids, Matilda and Eros, and they look pretty much alike. They've got impact craters on them, but in fact, uh, they, their structure is different. Now, one way we can, another way we can tell what something is made of, even if we don't have a piece of it to, to break apart, is if we can measure um, its size, which we can by taking pictures and knowing how far away we are from it, and if we could measure its mass, which by sending a spacecraft there, the spacecraft uh, feels the tug of gravity, and so it can get an estimate of the mass. If we know the mass and the size, we can find the density. And think about, say, a chunk of iron, that's really dense, and compare that to a chunk of styrofoam, that's very undense. Well, we, we would, even if we were blindfolded, we would know which was which by how dense it was, how much stuff it had. So in this case, Eros, you don't need to know what the density of it is. Three grams per cubic centimeter is about what a rock, the density of any common rock on Earth would be. Density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So we think this is basically a solid body with some dust on the surface of it. But the other one, Matilda, on the left, its density is much lower. It's a little over one. It's about 1.3. And yet it looks a lot like Eros. We can see that there's rock there. We think what's going on with this is that it's what's called a rubble pile. It's rock with uh, a lot of space inside. I'd say airspace, but of course it's in, it's in a vacuum. So here's just a little schematic. There's not much space here, but it could be a lot less dense, of course, if these were bigger. And we're gonna see this, this little diagram again as we go along. Comets, uh, on the, this is Comet Borelli, uh, the ones that we've been by, again, measuring the mass and the size, have densities much less even than the, the, the rubble pile asteroid, 0.3 to 0.6 grams per cubic centimeter. So there must be even more space there and it must be filled with some of these uh, ices that are not dense at all. So, how can we check the density of a Trojan asteroid to see whether it's more like a, a comet or the other asteroids? We do this, and this doesn't, you wouldn't think about this at first, but we do this by studying the way they rotate. Let me explain. Yes, if you think this looks like a potato, you're right. And if anybody didn't think that some of those asteroids look like potatoes, um, you're not like any student I've ever had, because they all say it looks like a potato. So we have a, 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 a potato on a chopstick here. So you folks out there are uh, us on Earth looking at the asteroid, and the asteroid's gonna be turning here as sunlight hits it. Well, the asteroid shines by reflecting sunlight, so the more area that's exposed, the more sunlight's gonna be reflected. So when you see this side of the asteroid, you'll be getting a relatively large amount of light. If I turn it a quarter of the way, you'll be getting less light because you're seeing it end on. When I turn it another quarter of the way, you're seeing the other side of the asteroid now, you're beginning more light again. And then when I turn it three quarters of the way, you'll be getting less light. And now I'm back to where I started. So if you think about what a graph of this would look like, there should be two high points and two low points. And lo and behold, that's what we see. This is what we call the light curve of an asteroid. This is a Trojan asteroid. You don't need to worry much about what these the axes say. This is time along the x-axis. Don't even worry about uh, what this unit is on the y-axis. It just measures brightness. Uh, it, it's magnitudes if you're uh, into uh, astronomy. And so here's where we see the broad side of the asteroid. And here's where we're seeing uh, an endpoint here, and we just have a little bit of overlap. So this has a period of about a little over 10 hours, and that's a really typical asteroid rotation period. Um, I'm not sure what the diameter of this one is, maybe 50 miles, something like that. So uh, main belt asteroids could have periods like this. Um, and actually, let me just say that working with students the way I have, uh, this is a good has been a good project for students to work on because a student can get something like this done. Hey, I found out something about the universe. I know how fast an asteroid rotates. And that's good for the student. It's also good for our project because then we have, we use these as building blocks. We get, you know, 50, 60, 100, 150 of these, and we get a, a picture of what a whole group of asteroids are doing. 
And that's what we were trying to do with the Trojan asteroids. Now we got, we found a number of things, um, and I'm only going to share one result with you right now, simply because of time. Uh, and that is the shortest rotation period that we found for a Trojan asteroid. Uh, again, we know this is time and this is brightness. This one's not very elongated like this. It's more like a round potato, almost, but not perfectly round. Uh, here, this rotation period is 4.84 hours. And I'll move on. Uh, I have a couple more slides on this. We have long periods. We have weird things going on. But let's just go back to our rubble pile here. Now, it turns out that if this thing rotates too fast, and the potato is pretty dense, so I'm not worried about this one, but if it went really, 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 really fast, and it were a rubble pile like that, and not very dense, and not held together, it's not a solid body, remember here. Well, you know what those carnival rides are like? The ones where you get in and they strap you in and there's a floor under your feet and that feels good. And then it spins faster and faster and faster and you feel something pushing your back out and then the floor falls away. And so you feel like you would fall straight down. Of course, you're actually being pressed back. Uh, this is what could happen to an asteroid here. It turns out that if it spins too fast, it will break up. And this breaking speed or, or period of rotation depends on the density. Uh, something that's really dense, like uh, dense rock or metal, can spin very fast. But something that's just a rubble pile, especially one of these very undense, uh, something like the comet nucleus, it can't spin very fast at all. And this being a physical science, we have equations of things. We actually can predict. Uh, what the density would be if something uh, is at, if things are breaking apart. So we have now no asteroids that have a shorter period than this. So we think that we may be near the, the uh, point at which asteroids would break up. This allows us to calculate what the density should be for the Trojan asteroids in this size. So I, I said just under five hours. The, this implies uh, a density of about half a gram per cubic centimeter, which compares very well. It's right smack dab in the middle of what we observe for comets. Again, even that not dense, uh, even an asteroid rubble pile has a density of greater than one. So our conclusion on this is that the Trojans seem more comet-like than asteroid-like. And this is in agreement with what uh, current models of solar system formation are these days. So that's the key takeaway in terms of the science here. I have more stuff that I could talk about, it, so feel free to ask if you would like. Continuing work now, uh, Bob Stevens has the uh, small telescopes in California, and he is continuing to uh, study Trojan asteroids. Uh, it turns out that if you observe the potato, the asteroid here, at different points in its orbit, you see it at different angles, and you see different uh, shapes to the light curve. I'm not getting this very well here. But you can put them all together over several years, and you can determine what the shape of the asteroid is. So Bob is carrying on the job. Uh, this is, of, of our observatories, these, this is the only one that's operational uh, right now. There are now are other um, ongoing surveys uh, the trend in astronomy is for uh, surveys that continually survey the sky every uh, few days. And eventually, given enough time, the feeling is, the hope is that enough accuracy will be attained to get uh, more data on uh, things that vary, like asteroids, to continue the work on this. One of the surveys is something called ATLAS, it stands for ATLAS. Terrestrial little hyphen last alert system. Um, this is actually designed to search for near Earth asteroids. They've got a telescope on the Big Island of Hawaii and one on Maui. And uh, okay, this is not my project. I'm simply, I thought their site was kind of interesting. Uh, they claim that they can give three weeks warning time for, uh, for a near Earth asteroid, 100 megaton county killer one week for a five megaton city killer, and one day for a 30 kiloton pound killer. 
just in case anybody was feeling calm about asteroids here uh, because we were studying far away ones, well, actually, you know, the near-Earth asteroids still are an issue. They do need to be uh, looked into, but I can't answer any questions about this. I just thought that was an interesting survey that they're doing. And a lot of us have been pushing for this for a long time. A mission is in the works to go to the Trojan asteroids. Uh, it's uh, a Discovery class mission uh, called Lucy, named after the, the, the African primate. And this is a long-term haul. It's, it's launching October of this year. It'll get a gravity boost going around a couple times. It will head to the L4 region, where it will pass several interesting targets. Come back, that happens in 2027 uh, and 2028. Then it will come back. Uh, circle around the Earth a couple more times, get a gravity boost, and head to the L5 regions uh, where it will arrive in 2033. So stay tuned, but don't hold your breath. And with that, uh, now I would like to take you to uh, my favorite place I've, I've observed, uh, Cerro Tololo in Chile, and just show you what it's like to go on an observing run uh, at this wonderful place. Uh, my colleague Bob Stevens uh, has pointed out that some of the hardest work to get done to go on a trip like this is done before you ever set foot at the telescope. Uh, first of all, get NSF grant or get money from somewhere, get observing time, and each of these things requires writing a proposal, uh, planning, sometimes you have to wait a year because things aren't in the right place once you do get all these things. So uh, this is a very time consuming process. But once you've done this, then you fly to Chile, to uh, Santiago, the capital city, and you meet up at the official astronomer's meetup point. Sounds very secret. In fact, it's the Starbucks at the Santiago airport. Um, Chile is a very modern country and highly recommended for a visit. Then, at this point, you've been traveling for over 24 hours. You've been sleeping on a plane. You get on another plane, and you fly to the north of the country, to the city of La Serena, which is a beautiful old, uh, the central city is a Spanish uh, colonial city, uh, second oldest city in Chile. But you can see the Pacific out here. There's a bay. There's golden sand. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, resort town these days, it's it's a great place to be. And the reason why you go there is that that's where the observatory headquarters are. So from there, it's another hour and a half up the mountain to get to the telescopes. Uh, astronomers do not drive this road. Uh, we are driven, and I'm very glad we are. It's a dirt road and, and uh, can, can be a little bit tricky in places. But on your way, you might uh, pass a the Chilean version of Talboy. Uh, called the Waso, and this gentleman was out uh, checking on his flock of goats. You can see that the uh, surroundings are very dry. This is at the edge of the Atacama Desert, which is actually the driest desert on Earth. It's smaller than the Sahara, but it's, it's actually drier in terms of rainfall, which is why it's a good place for telescopes. Uh, but if, if the land is irrigated, it's wonderful for growing grapes. Uh, as you may know, Chilean wines are uh, among the famous, most famous in the world, and now we're starting to import more fruits from Chile as well, some of which come from this area. Well, as you uh, ascend the mountain, eventually you see the telescopes uh, coming up in front of you, and now we're on the top of the mountain looking down uh, at some of the buildings. This is where the staff stay. This is the office building where you get your, your official parka and keys to your car and your room. And then this over here is the astronomer's uh, lodgings, where this was taken on a not quite so uh, clear day. But the wings here on either side are rooms. And then the big uh, structure in the middle is a dining room where they have chefs who prepare the meals. So uh, it's OK. You don't have to. It's not you're not roughing it other than staying up all night and working long hours We're, we are well taken care of. But if you've come up on the day that you're going to observe after spending the night on the plane and the, the, two, the multiple plane rides, well, you need to get up to the telescope, especially if you have, uh, a, say, a new person in your party. Uh, in this case, I was with a student and just wanted to get up and show Dan the, uh, the light path through the telescope. 
This is a 36 inch telescope. It's one of the best telescopes in the world. It goes exactly where you point it. It doesn't move uh, yeah, out of the ordinary. Uh, right here, this is the solid state camera we use. And uh, what, what's needed, what people need to know is just in case something does happen where you need to close off to keep light from getting in. And that's what I was showing him. Later on, uh, you need to make sure that the fancy thermos that keeps the camera very cold is filled with liquid nitrogen in the middle of the night. That's usually the student's job. Uh, so Dan was getting his hand uh, in at that. But most of the time when we're observing, sadly, this is where we are. We are in a brightly lit room with lots of computers. And I'll show you one that has more computers yet as we go. Jennifer is running the uh, observing computer right here. I am most likely transferring data and making multiple copies. There's a weather station over here, and Bob is probably over here uh, looking at the data we've already gotten, so we can tell if we have a five-hour asteroid period or a 50-hour period, because you don't need to observe us at often if it's very slow. So we try to observe as we go on this. This is just a raw screen of what you see when you're looking at it. It's not a pretty picture. It's not like a, what you would see on a strongly picture of the day, uh, just dots on the screen. That's probably the asteroid right there. Uh, the Trojan asteroids are not trailed. We might take up to five minute exposures, but because they're further away, they uh, don't trail the way some of the others do. And then occasionally you get something like this. Bob and I were talking about this one today. Uh, not exactly clear what's going on here. Uh, we, his best guess, and I think he may be right, is that somehow that we have a guider that, that uh, focuses on a star and keeps it in the screen so that the stars stay nice and round. We might have actually gotten onto an asteroid here. I'm not sure, but it's very weird. And this is why you have to have somebody looking at the telescope and what's coming out of the telescope because we did not want to take a whole series like this. Well, moving on to the four meter telescope, here's a student Derek, me and Bob at the four meter telescope. This one is open. The light comes in up here, comes down to the mirror, the main mirror, which is down at this end, reflects back up off a, a smaller mirror here on this uh, dark structure and goes back through this tube down to the camera at the bottom. Now, I mentioned that, that, that that's a four meter telescope. It's 12 feet across, basically. So now I'm with the student, Kyle, we're inside the telescope. This is all uh, in, at the base of the telescope. The mirror is above us, this, this white structure here facing outward. Camera's right below us, or uh, behind us, sorry. And uh, astronomers are not let loose with this one. You can see that there are just too many things to deal with here. So we have experts. Uh, here, Manuel is the telescope operator, and uh, Mauricio was the uh, software and electronics expert. I believe this was some troubleshooting that was going on before our run. At any rate, it, it got fixed, and we never lost any time at all to uh, you know things going wrong with, with that telescope. Uh, these guys are the best, and they make the place a wonderful place to visit. Pardon me, Linda. In the back, it says no mover telescopio. <laughs> Don't move the telescope. All right. <laughs> Some things translate pretty well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Uh, more people, more hands-on, uh, more bigger, more big screen, uh, but now we're at the four meter. So it was always one of the great paradoxes that I, I said when I go to Chile to go observing, uh, I'm going to learn the southern constellations because there's so many gorgeous things to see there. But the trouble is, when the night was beautiful and I could have seen constellations, we were observing. And vice versa, when I could go out you know, and look around, there were no stars. So uh, that's one of the things that I do regret, and I must go back and spend more time as a tourist, I think. But the one blessing about cloudy nights is that even cloudy sun days give wonderful views. I mean, I just love this picture. I love the undercast of clouds here and the overcast here. 
So I, eventually, often it does cloud up, even when you have a cloudy sunset. In this case, we're looking off now to the east, to the snowy Andes. Uh, these are peaks that would be about 14,000 feet. We were at 7,000 feet. And uh, again, the pink clouds in the sky are lovely, uh, at, but not at that time conducive to observing. And here's where if you have the room lights up kind of high, you might want to turn them down because I did want to leave you with some shots of the clear, uh, clear shots of the southern sky. Uh, the center of the Milky Way gets right overhead in the southern hemisphere, and it's just gorgeous. You see all these dust lanes uh, in the Milky Way. It's, it's fabulous and something that is not to be missed. Here, this is the large cloud, uh, Magellanic Cloud, the small Magellanic Cloud. And they really do look like little bits of cirrus. The first time people see them, they tend to think, oh, cloud. But no, it's, it, it's two nearby galaxies that are relatively large in the sky. And this, then, is my favorite of the dark sky uh, pictures. I'd like to say that Bob uh, just walked out and, and said, hey, let's take a picture. But I think he planned this one very carefully. Um, so here we have the Milky Way rising up just over us. And uh, this is the end. Uh, putting this talk together, I just realized how lucky I have been to have found an interesting topic to study, to be able to work with good people from two countries, uh, to train good students, um, all of whom have gone on in technical fields, uh, to travel to such beautiful and exotic and yet friendly places to work. So I'm really grateful uh, for the career CAD, and I thank Drew and Kopiernik for inviting me. I may be happy to take the questions now. All right. Great. Um, well, fantastic, uh, Linda. Um, again, it's funny because I've known you back when we knew each other in Boston, but uh, mm -hmm. clearly you filled me in on <laughs> on a few years of, of, of work that you've done. It's just, uh, just mm -hmm. outstanding and what a rewarding career this must have been. Uh, let's see here. Um, do we have a couple of questions uh, right offhand? Um, actually, bef even before we get to the questions, I'm gonna, uh, uh, when you and I first uh, connected here on the um, on Zoom while we were, well, everyone else was taking their bio break, you had mentioned that you were down at, um, um, uh, with Carl Sagan and, and Drake uh, mm -hmm. at Arecibo. Maybe can you talk a little bit about, uh, about that? that episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, there were three of us from Cornell who were summer students at Arecibo in 74, and they came down to listen. They used the Arecibo telescope to listen to a couple of galaxies. I believe one of them was M33, not, not the Andromeda galaxy, uh, but, but the triangulum galaxy. And I mean, the, 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 the idea that we would get a signal from a galaxy you know, it was pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, it would be pretty diluted by the time it got here. Uh, but uh, Carl really was disappointed. Carl was the eternal optimist about getting, uh, you know, that, that we would find something as soon as we looked. Um, Frank had been at it, I think, for longer, and so he was not surprised. Interesting. All right. Very cool. Very cool. But let's sort of go over to uh, some of the questions here. Um, let's see here. Um, Mike asks, how closely clumped are the Trojans around the, uh, Jupiter and the Sun, uh, L4 and L5 Lagrange points? Are there any asteroids in the L3, L1, or L2 Lagrange points, or are they disturbed by other solar system objects? Right. Um, so about those other points, L1, 2, and 3, those are unstable equilibrium. I don't know how much physics Mike and uh, I, you, you know, but uh, basically it's like, it would be like balancing a, a pencil on its point. In principle, you could do it, but any slight little nudge would push it away. Mm. So L4 and L5 are the ones that are stable. Uh, so no, we don't think there are any asteroids there. Uh, you can see that, that the things are not in close formation around L4 and L5. Uh, they, the, the asteroids move back and forth. Uh, it's called vibration. So uh, they, they kind of circle around, they get a little closer to Jupiter, and then they get a little, a little further away, but they get pushed back, uh, essentially. All right. So. All right, thanks. Uh, Mary asks, does it take a while to adjust to the altitude in Chile? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, and in fact, sometimes, I, you know, you, you, 
if you're there for not very long, you don't adjust at all. Also, adjusting from daytime to nighttime takes a while. So yeah, it, it's 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 hard. It's hard work, and and especially in the winter time when you have like nice nice long nights. Yes, it can be hard. Seven thousand feet is not is not as bad as say fourteen thousand feet, which is where Mauna Kea and mm-hmm. Hawaii is. That one is brutal. Wow. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, David asks, are those groups of asteroid protoplanets or failed p- protoplanets? Which, the, tr- the Trojans? It, well, I guess you can choose. He, did, he didn't specify. He says, are those okay. groups of asteroids protoplanets okay. or failed protoplanets? Well, uh, the Trojans, if, if they're comets, I guess in a way you could, you could say they're sort of, uh, they may be related to planetesimals. Uh, they probably are not very evolved. They may have a very, uh, I mentioned that they're dark, that they don't reflect very much light, but we think that they may have a lot of ices inside. Mm. So <laughs> this is a timely topic right now. Think about what the piles of snow, like right now we're getting snow here in New Hampshire where I am, uh, and, and as the snow comes down, it's pristine, it's white, it's beautiful, it's lovely. And then as they pile it up, and it sits for a while, you know, it's February and it gets into March. Think what the snow, piles of snow look like. They get darker and darker because you've got dirt mixed into it. And so we may actually have a crust, a dark crust around an icy interior. All right. Um, in your bio, you mentioned that uh, the, there's actually an asteroid that is named after you. Can you tell me, tell us yes. about that? Tell us about how you discovered that and I didn't discover it. Okay, uh, a, all right. A, a colleague of mine discovered it. Oh, okay. And, and it, at Lowell Observatory, in fact, mm-hmm. and he uh, named it. Yeah, I mean, the person who discovers an asteroid can can name it uh, within certain constraints. Like, for example, when when my group discovered some Trojan asteroids, I said, "I'm going to name them after women in the Iliad and the Aeneid." Well, it turns out, first of all, there aren't very many women, and mm-hmm. secondly, they all had things named after them. But also, a commission names those. Um, so this was a, a colleague who had discovered a bunch of asteroids, and he uh, named them after colleagues. Uh, he also liked classical music a lot, so he so there's Beethoven, Brahms, uh, lots of the B composers have have their own names. Um, actually, my one of my very close colleagues in astronomy, Faith Vilas, um, I'm 3506, she's 3507. Uh, we work together at the National Science Foundation and oh, call ourselves the Asteroid Twins, yeah, so. Very cool, nice, nice, nice. Uh, well, um, oh yeah, David asked specifically about the, about the Trojan uh, uh, asteroids, and I think you sort of meant, you know, answered that, so. Mm-hmm. Well, um, fantastic uh, talk, uh, Linda. Thank you so much for uh, taking time uh, out of your retirement to uh, come back and uh, continue to teach. Um, really enjoy that and uh, um, we look forward to um, again having you uh, come back and actually uh, see our modest observatory and, and uh, perhaps uh, do a, a talk on another subject uh, when we can. Oh, I love that. And, I, have, uh, I have a very interesting uh, character from the history of astronomy that I'd love, love to talk to you about. Sometime. Excellent. All right. Well, then okay. we'll make it a date okay. and we'll, uh, we'll make that Great. happen. And, uh, okay. So uh, thank you all very much. I do uh, uh, appreciate you all being here. Uh, again, we want to remind uh, Jennifer Prow- uh, Paulus and Mike- Michael Nagorny, uh, if you would, uh, in the chat is uh, our, uh, the registration at Copernic. If you would uh, let us know that you uh, heard your name and uh, you know, you, so that we can arrange to get your uh, family membership. All right, um, so now we have, um, and pardon me for, uh, delving into sort of a, a hillbilly mentality, but it's one of these uh, hold my beer, I want to try something uh, moments. Uh, Jeremy Cardi is our uh, one of the educators up here at uh, Copernic and is, uh, we call him our, our um, live stream astronomer, and he has done a number of the uh, live observing uh, streams that we've done now. Unfortunately tonight, uh, the weather here does, is not permitting that to happen, and but uh, he's going to uh, take over this live stream from his home. So uh, the hold my beer moment is uh, we, I need to sort of stop my stream and then he's going to pick it up. But he's going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, upcoming live stream 
uh, observing sessions that he uh, he's uh, planning on doing uh, the next time we've got some decent uh, uh, decent skies to look at. But meanwhile, you could also go to our YouTube channel and uh, and actually look at at some of those previous live streams. So we um, he did one uh, with Comet Neowise. Um, we also did a uh, another one with the uh, uh, M42, the uh, uh, Orion Nebula. Pardon me, it's been a long day. But uh, anyway, so if you want, uh, uh, please hang on for a little bit. Jeremy will uh, will take that over. Again, thank you so much. Again, if you enjoyed uh, tonight and you're in a position to help us out, check the uh, the donate uh, uh, button downstairs, you know, right below in the description. Again, if uh, you you uh, would like to support us in a, in a substantial way, uh, get a family membership. Uh, again, you go to our website. And you can uh, click on that. It's all done online, and we'll we'll get a, a membership card out to you. So, uh, hope you all have a, a great uh, rest of your uh, evening. And uh, we're going to take a break at least for one more week uh, on live streams. We'll take a, and uh, I'm right now in the process of uh, working out the details for uh, March 5th. I think is the next uh, Friday, or not not next Friday, but the following Friday. And that one will actually be somebody from uh, the Johnson Space Flight Center uh, talking about the Artemis program. And uh, so once we get those details uh, nailed down, we, I reached out uh, earlier this week and the person, my contact says, well, I haven't been without power or water in, in two days. And so uh, she just, just got it back uh, this afternoon. So she said that she'll be uh, working, on, working on getting those details uh, set out. Again, hope you uh, had uh, an opportunity to celebrate Copernic's birthday, and we are going to look forward to, uh, to having you be there. So Jeremy, um, if you'd let me know one way or another if you're ready to, to take over, I will uh, end my stream. And uh, so, all right, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to count down from 10, and then Jeremy, you f figure out uh, when, you, when you want to take over. So, uh, all right, he says he's ready to go. So, 10, 9, Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So long. Okay. Looks like we've picked up on the stream. I love how seamless that, that works. That was almost immediate. Very cool. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, I'm trying a new camera method that I hope to use on future streams. I'm actually plugged right now in, into my iPad's camera, but I'll be able to do the same thing with my, my phone's camera, which might make it easier to, if we ever want to use the phone again for astrophotography, might make it easier to convey that. Um, <clears throat> So one first thing I want to start with, uh, I want to wish uh, Nicholas Copernicus, Nikolai Copernicus, a, a happy birthday. That's what our winter star party is all about, and uh, we we celebrated with with the cake in this in this program. Um, so really, really awesome. Uh, next up, uh, of course, I want to thank uh, both Robert and I and Dr. French for their awesome presentations. While the sky is not behaving tonight, at least. Uh, we can celebrate and discuss astronomy um, together over the live stream here. So great, uh, great to hear from them uh, on their through their through their presentations. Uh, let's see. Next up, I want to jump over to the web browser here. Um, I like like Drew said, uh, we're not going to be able to stream. Of course, I'm at home. <laughs> and I don't have the best skies where I am, so we're not going to be able to stream the sky tonight. It's just too cloudy. In fact, we've had terrible weather. Um, we were discussing that a little bit uh, with the um, Astronomical Society, the Copernic Astronomical Society. And it's just been not great. <laughs> and we're, we're begging at this point for some really nice clear skies to work with. Uh, so hopefully those are coming, um, especially as we head into the spring. Um, and it'll also be nice and comfortable to observe in the domes as well. Um, so, uh, we do have a, ba uh, a backlog, though, of, of streams to check out if you missed any. 
um, right here on our uh, channel. It's, it's, if you scroll down, we'll always have our uh, upcoming live streams up here. But you scroll down a bit, you'll get to the observing live streams. Uh, we've done the uh, most recent one was the M42, the Orion live stream. It was an awesome program uh, where we really uh, got some decent pictures of of uh, the nebula, the great nebula of Orion. And uh, we did, we tried to do <laughs> the, the uh, conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, but we got clouded out. Um, but it was a, a great conversation. We had a lot, a lot of people tuning in um, and we got to at least discuss where you can find it if you can see it. Um, we also mentioned Comet Neowise. Um, those were uh, decent as well. Um, but hopefully we'll continue to improve upon these programs um, and uh, get more and more objects and, and build up our, our uh, log of, of objects we've explored. Uh, okay, so that's that. That's there if you want to go back and check those out. Uh, next up, I also sort of, this is sort of just a free form because I wanted to talk to you guys because I haven't in a while. <laughs> um, but we want to also congratulate NASA's Perseverance rover for its successful landing on Mars. This picture was brilliant. Um, again, I think Patrick from uh, the Astronomical Society described it as the best astrophoto taken um, yesterday, the 18th, when it landed. Um, and I completely agree with that. Um, it was a brilliant um, uh, shot. This came back, this came through uh, today, I think, yeah. Um, of course, it was taken yesterday. This was just before it touched down. Um, and uh, you can see the cables uh, stretching up to the jetpack that, that was uh, deployed uh, to slow it down enough, and then it drops it down on these tethers. Uh, so, fantastic news there. It's as far as they know, it's in perfect health. They'll have to do some more analysis on the most recent uh, on the data it's sent back to make sure all systems are operational, especially as they get things started with it. But there's a there's a couple pictures here. Here's one of uh, the wheel. I think this is the front right wheel. They said. Um, and the cool part is, too, they're getting color data back. Um, these are just raw images. They're not color corrected, but um, some f fantastic views just from the nav cams, um, not even uh, the mast cam, which is really the going to be the, the showstopper for, for the rover. And this one was great, too. This was from uh, the high-rise uh, camera aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and you can see it captured the landing. And I remember they did something similar for uh, Curiosity. Um, it must have been the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter as well, and they, they were able to, to image the, the landing, and just extraordinary that they were able to get a picture like that um, from a satellite orbiting Mars. <clears throat> so fantastic view there, too. So uh, if you want to learn more about Perseverance, you can always go to uh, mars.nasa.gov and... Um, I believe they'll eventually, uh, it's not up yet. I think they have, it'll be a little bit yet before they get it running, but they'll eventually have a program on this website uh, where you can follow along with where Perseverance is on Jezero Crater um, and where it's going and potential mis mission paths. Um, so you can follow along with that in that sense, and that's, that's a pretty exciting uh, uh, feature that they, they're, they're going to add to this program. Uh, okay, so congratulations to Perseverance. We'll, we'll look forward to what comes back. Um, I'm also contemplating uh, putting a stream together uh, that that shares uh, more information about it and more images that come out over the next week and coming months, I suppose. Um, especially, I wanted to let you know about the. There will be an HD video of the landing for the first time ever, um, which I'm super excited to see. Um, so. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you in, in, informed on that, too. Uh, okay. Let's see. I want to move on now just to show you what we've been working with as far as clear skies to go. Of course, if you want to learn more about Copernic, go to copernic.org. Uh, and this is our clear sky chart. You can access it at the very bottom of the page. Oops, went too far. Come on. There we go. Uh, very bottom of our page, you 
clear sky chart, click there, and it looks like Sunday would be, you know, her, our best chance if there is one. Um, that's the first, you know, set of clear skies I've seen in a while. <laughs> um, but we're going to keep watching this, and I, I, it'd be so nice to get in a position where we're expecting, you know, pretty clear conditions uh, over a couple week period. We've had those happen from time to time. And that way we can really schedule some good streams. Um, but if at the, at the rate we're going right now, it's almost like if we schedule a stream, we're just never gonna we're never gonna have one. So they almost have to be spontaneous in some ways, just because the weather's been so dynamic um, over the over the winter here. Okay, so that's the clear sky chart. And of course, go to Copernic.org to learn more about us if you're new to the channel, and hit subscribe too. And it like the like the video if you like the presentations tonight. Uh, I'm gonna jump into Stellarium here in just a moment. Um, if you've been on our streams before, you've seen Stellarium. Uh, Stellarium.org is where you can download free planetarium software, or you can go to the web-based version if you'd prefer not to download. Um, and this web-based version is super functional, um, pretty basic, uh, but it does what you need it to do, which is find what's out in the sky at a given time and given location. Um, so I'm going to show you the downloaded version though, uh, but feel free to check this one out too. I have to switch my source to Stellarium. There it is. And here's what we got going in the sky right now. This is live. Um, if you saw our Winter Skies live stream just last week, we also uh, demonstrated this program there. Uh, but right now, if you know we have clear skies, we could be observing the moon and Mars. So we can go to Mars here. Of course, that would be super appropriate. I'm kind of disappointed we weren't able to, to do a Mars stream again um, because of the, the rover, of course. Um, but here it is, here's Mars. And you can see it's sort of a gibbous phase. And yes, Mars does go through some slight phases, not, uh, not as drastic as, as the moon or the inner planets like Venus and Mercury, but we do occasionally get, sort of view it from the side and get some gibbous Ma uh, Mars phases. And uh, there's that. Uh, of course, just above Mars, uh, this sort of leads me into another stream I'm considering. It's the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters right here. Uh, br a brilliant star cluster, open star cluster. These are brand new stars, relatively. Um, spreading out into space um, and forming their own solar systems. It's sort of the post-Orion Nebula phase, right? So there's really no star formation occurring anymore. It's very wispy nebula you see here and, and gas and dust. Um, but the new stars are finally spreading out from their birthplace. <clears throat> so that's Pleiades. I want to observe the stars in Pleiades too. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to that. I want to do a star cluster stream in, in general and hunt for some open and globular star clusters. There's some good ones out right now. And I do want to do another moon stream. I think those are always fun to do. Um, go on another tour, maybe try and get it at a different phase than we, we had before. Um, and go on another tour of the moon. Looks like we're at uh, first quarter here. Is that right? Should be right, yeah, first quarter. Um, and we'll do, we'll hopefully get another stream done in there. I wouldn't mind catching the Orion Nebula again. That's not it. This is it. Uh, catching the Orion Nebula one more time at least, uh, because we will soon, as we head into the spring and summer, we'll lose our opportunity to observe it. Um, and maybe I can, oh, that's the other thing I wanted to mention. Um, we just got a new streaming laptop system um, before I was using uh, a MacBook, which wasn't most ideal, um, just because uh, you really push the hardware to its limits, at least the one I have that doesn't have a dedicated graphics chip. Um, so we, we have a dedicated streaming laptop now, and uh, we can really push that one to, the, to some hot, much higher limits. And uh, more than that, it's running Windows, and there's a lot of open source uh, astronomy or astrophotography photo stacking software uh, to download for Windows versus Mac, which a lot of uh, on Mac a lot more of it is 
uh, uh, paid software, which is which is fine, of course. But like for especially for our use case and for promoting um, uh, amateur, I guess, astrophotography um, and getting everyone involved in it, it's great to have open source software that everyone can download. Um, so we're going to be doing that through Windows now and. Uh, Hopefully I'll be able to bump the resolution up on the, on the laptop as well. We can get some clearer streams um, and um, hopefully it, <laughs> the laptop, like my MacBook, it won't overheat and we won't cut out our streams anymore uh, like in the past. I see someone has a question. Um, Nicholas has a question. So I will get to questions uh, in just a, a minute or two. Um, so just give me one more second. Um, so that is uh, Stellarium if you want to explore more. Um, you can add constellations and labels and constellation art, really do a full tour of the sky. It is a at-home planetarium. Um, Copernic, of course, has its portable planetarium that we've used at schools, libraries. We've ta it's, uh, uh, we take it on trips. Um, now, of course, we haven't because uh, it's a big inflatable dome, not the best combination right now. Um, so this is a great tool to use um, in lieu of that and in lieu of uh, going to a planetarium. They also, there's a Stellarium app for phones. Uh, there's other apps like Starwalk uh, that you can use there too. Um, and uh, that's nice because it uses your built-in compass and you can just pan around the sky and see everything. Uh, so at that point, that's about all I have to say. I just wanted to mention we've made some upgrades um, to our, our streaming setup. Uh, We'll be able to get some clearer pictures back, hopefully be able to demonstrate some photo stacking um, and some photo processing on that uh, new system. And uh, we have more streams planned. It's just a matter of if the sky behaves and uh, yeah, if it stops snowing too, because <laughs> because Copernic's on, uh, on a mountain, uh, we've uh, accrued quite a bit of snowfall and, uh, and not a lot of it's melting either. So. <laughs> um, we, we also have to get rid of some of that snow too uh, on top of it. So hopefully we don't get as much snow um, in the future. Okay, uh, yeah, I can take some questions in the chat here um, as we wrap up tonight's stream. Let's see if I missed anything so far. It sounds like the transition went, did go smoothly. It looked like it did for my end as well. So I'm glad glad to hear that. chat not updating? Maybe it's not. Let's see. Yeah, uh, Nicholas, if you haven't typed your, your question already, feel free to... Oh, here it is. Yeah, my chat didn't, just didn't update um, for some reason. Oh, about the Pleiades. Yes, it's Pleiades or Seven Sisters. It has a lot of names. It's a very visible star cluster um, in uh, the wintertime especially. If we go back over here, I'll show you where you can find it. Yep. It's in Taurus the Bull. So here's Taurus. Here's Aldebaran, a very bright star, bright red star. There's the bull. You can see it's sort of Pleiades uh, is in the body of uh, Taurus, and here are the horns of Taurus. Um, so here is Pleiades. And let's see if I refresh this page if that question comes through again. Yeah, sure. Feel feel free to ask um, whatever you got. Happy to answer. Uh, why are Nicholas asked why are those stars so close together? So this is what we call. Wait, but there we go. Get the image loaded in so we can see it in great detail. So this is what's called an open star cluster. And you can see these stars have very, very much have a blue hue to them. And uh, the wispy gas surrounding it is sort of a sort of a reflective nebula, except it's very low density. There's not a lot of uh, material there left over from the star formation. Um, so you can expose this region enough, though, to collect that light bouncing off the dust clouds and whatnot. Um, so an open star cluster is where it's post uh, uh, 
star forming nebula. So uh, like the Orion Nebula we did we looked at during that observing live stream, you could sort of see where s newborn stars are funneling out of that ne nebula. And you can sort of think this is the next step in that in that uh, stellar formation phase. They've moved further away, but they're still pretty close together in this cluster. And this is sort of where the sun was um, billions of years ago in a, in a similar situation, in a similar cluster, grouped together um, with its brother and sister stars. <laughs> um, and you slowly over time spread away from each other, sort of take up your own zones in space, and uh, then form a solar system uh, with the, the remaining material uh, surrounding the, uh, the system. Uh, does that answer answer your question? There are similar, uh, well, similarly, even, well, clusters where the stars are even closer to each other, um, and we see those as globular star clusters, and that's sort of at the other end of the stellar life cycle, where you have um, ancient stars, a lot of uh, white dwarfs, a lot of red dwarf stars, um, dying stars, all very close and clumped together, um, so there, those stars are billions of years old, um, and they, they form these clusters on the outskirts of galaxies. These are more in the central part of the ga galaxy, um, the, uh, where the new, newborn stars are forming. Oh, good to see you, uh, and hear from you again, rather, as, as Stacy as well. Um, again, I hope, hope we'll be able to do some more observing soon. Um, and we'll keep you posted about that. Again, we do have community posts active on our channel now, um, so it's a great way to stay in touch there or our other social media platforms that you can explore. Um, I think we have most of those in the video description if you want to check it out. Nicholas said, oh, <laughs> no, no problem, <laughs> Nicholas. As long as they, they're, they're coming through, that's all that matters. <laughs> all right, I'll stick around for another minute here to see if there's anything else, uh, any other questions. Um, I could, of course, you, you, you all know I could, I guess, uh, rant, uh, rant on for forever <laughs> about space. So I, I won't, I won't keep you all. You, you've had, uh, we've had a great night of um, discussions in astronomy, um, and. There's so much more coming coming up, um, especially with the, the the new rover on Mars. Uh, there'll be a lot more to discuss there. So we'll 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 stay tuned for that for sure. We haven't really done any sort of like I I, I guess like new uh, news show or something like that, um, like where you're, you're you're taking very current events in astronomy and we share them with you. But that's something I've thought about for a bit, and it might be worth exploring with, with Perseverance. So as stuff comes out, uh, we'll, we'll do our, our best to, to share it with you and our thoughts on it. I think that'd be, that'd be a neat idea. Um, uh, Nicholas says, what kind of camera would get a shot at them? Um, so I'm hoping, I don't know if I have my camera settings on here, let's see. I add them. Uh, it doesn't look like I, I switched my or I did a, I built a new PC recently, and I don't think my settings carried over. So I, I think I'll have to re-add my. Yeah, I'll have to re-add my my sensor, and the telescope that I use to this version of Stellarium. Um, so, this is close enough though. This is an EOS Canon camera, um, and this gives you. A slight sense. I don't know what is this on a scope. Yeah, you can see as you change scopes, it really does drastically change the wide, the, the field of view you have for your telescope for your your camera shot. So um, I think we'll be able to get a decent portion of it with my my camera and the six inch telescope, but we'll have to see what we end up with. We might need to get something a little bit wider field. Um, maybe my reflector could do it. Uh, 
let's see what I miss. Oh, thank, thank you all for the, the kind comments. It's good to have you. Nicholas is in agreement about the, the, like sort of like like a podcast or just you know share your thoughts. I'd still like to do it. I think our live stream format works really well. Um, I think I, I like doing the live streams more than I guess uh, fully like developed video. I think there's a place for that for sure, but that's that's out there in a lot of ways already, um, and I, I think it's great to have the chance to talk with with our audience and our community. So. I would still probably do it as a live stream format so we could chat with you and put it at a convenient time where people aren't working or at school. Yeah, like explore the, the events for the month, what's coming up and try and potentially make a more regular thing out of it. Oh yes, Stacy, that is another thing we hope is in the near near future um, is uh, a return to in-person observing and in-person uh, presentations and whatnot. We do miss that a lot. The, the, the streams have, have, allow, have allowed us to reach a wider audience for sure. And uh, it's, it's great that we've been able to keep a community together and uh, chat about the stars. Um, but of course, there's nothing like going in person and, and viewing uh, through the telescope yourself and see, having those photons hit your own eye uh, rather than get electronically transferred uh, over <laughs> through, through YouTube. Oh, Nicholas says, can I borrow your camera? Oh, I, I wish. Um, so the camera I use is, is, uh, my, my, I guess my, my personal one, but, um, we, we do have some other, uh, DSLRs at Copernic. Those are actually the ones I used, um, in the, uh, to start out with a lot of astrophotography, especially wide field and long exposure stuff. Um, so like, I think I remember taking a class at Copernic in 20, I think it was either my junior or senior year, so 2012, I think. Um, uh, I took a class at Copernic and I got to learn how to use those DSLRs and it was a great experience. I think that was with uh, Dr. Gaidosh, um, also named Nicholas, Nicholas Gaidosh. Um, and uh, that was a great opportunity and I, I, I hope we, you know, in the future we'll be able to provide opportunities like that um, and, uh, again, if you do have a cell phone, a smartphone, um, doesn't even have to be like the most, most modern smartphone ever. Like I, I was able to do some, like during that stream, we had a, a couple of weeks back, I got to, to do some pretty decent, uh, observing and astrophotography with, uh, you know, a very basic sensor and a early Android device. Um, I got, it's not any deep sky astrophotography, but I, the brighter stuff, I was able to do some imaging on the planets. Um, definitely the moon is always a good target because there's just so much light coming from it. Um, there, there, it's a great way to start, um, especially as the cameras get more advanced, um, in smartphones and they get, they sort of, like, I think in general, smartphones have completely, uh, taken over the point and shoot industry. <laughs> like I don't, I, I personally have no interest in getting a point and shoot just because this is perfectly adequate for a lot of the photography I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's sort of, you, but it's, they, they want to sort of get you to the point where you're even questioning if you want a DSLR. That'll never be the case for the, prof for, for professional photographers. Um, but for uh, just the day-to-day -day person, um, they're, they're becoming more and more functional in that regard. And the fact that you can capture even a view of the stars and the Milky Way with smartphones now and doing some like proper image stacking on those is incredible. I think that's a huge, uh, feat of engineering and, uh, and software development too. 
so uh, I think that that is worth continuing to explore um, and then slowly ramp up to uh, some more advanced uh, tech, some more advanced camera sensors. Um, once you go down, like, <laughs> I mean, I, I was I was told this almost a year ago now uh, when I started investing a little bit more into astrophotography, um, that once you go down the rabbit hole, you don't you don't really come out <laughs> and there's so much to explore. So Oh, okay, Nicholas, I'll look out for for your internship uh, application. Um, as, as I've mentioned on all your streams, I, at least in normal circumstances, I, I am the intern coordinator. Right now, things are a little bit different where we just had to set our resources uh, or prioritize different resources. Um, so uh, we are trying to pay attention to the, the applications and, and uh, get back to students. Um, but of course, we, we just don't immediately have uh, have uh, tasks to do um, until we return to in-person work. Um, so, so hopefully uh, that'll be uh, an option as, as things improve, as we head into the spring and the summer. Um, maybe that'll, that'll, that opportunity will, will, will come about. So I'll, I'll check it out for sure. Yeah, and, and Art uh, uh, mentioned that, yes, I, I too started as an intern at Copernic, and uh, I've just never wanted to leave <laughs> because, like, it, it's a, a, a fascinating place, like, in the sense uh, that it's it's a great opportunity to sh put, bring a community together in an, like, in an area that otherwise just wouldn't have a lot of access to the stars or uh, the opportunity to, to observe to the capacity we can provide at Copernic. Um, both, I mean, in part because of our weather, like there's no way around it. Binghamton weather is not the greatest. It's, com it's often comparable to Seattle weather <laughs> and they're infamous for cloudy skies. Um, but the fact that this facility exists um, and once I, once I learned it existed, I, I didn't wanna, wanna ever leave. <laughs> And um, I'm still still here, and I'm I'm happy that we've been able to explore these these uh, new opportunities together through our live streams and and ramp those up. Uh, and there's always something new to learn at Copernic. I think that's that's the key takeaway. Um, you there there's there's never a dull moment, um, and we keep exploring new things. Uh, so we'll we'll. Well, yeah, it's interning is a is a great opportunity for students, um, and we hope to ramp that back up soon. Linus the six year old says he thinks Elon rocks. <laughs> Assume that means Elon Elon Musk, maybe. <laughs> oh, and sure thing, Patrick. Yeah, that um, he mentioned that Patrick mentioned uh, from the Astronomical Society the 360 camera, um, and that's something I, I've wanted to get back to for a bit too. Um, again, I've been a little bit wary about leaving it out in the cold, although theoretically it might be to its benefit because it's it can um, in summer weather in the sun it can uh, overheat um, just because of how much heat it's already producing. Um, but if it's moving around enough, it can it can stay cool cool down. It's just the uh, being direct in direct sunlight can can overheat it in higher temperatures. Uh, so that yeah, that three hundred and sixty camera was uh, pretty nice to to use for uh, three hundred and sixty views of the sky. And I, I we put together a time lapse. Uh, I could probably show it here. Uh, at least I can. Let me go back to. Web browser view. Uh, I can find it in our upload somewhere. If you have not seen it before, whoops, I don't want to play all. <laughs> not, not just now. <laughs> Maybe later. I'll go into our uploads and see if I can find the 360 camera shot. Time lapse. Is this it? Oh, yeah, the 360 scavenger hunt. Um, 
So we used a 360 camera to record this video here. And you can, just like any other 360 video, you can pan around and look at the sky. And you can watch the Milky Way rise up. I think I have to improve the bit rate the next time I do this because it's a little pixelated. Um, but here's Jupiter and Saturn. Hopefully we get those again soon. We should as we head in the spring, late spring and summer, we'll get to see Jupiter and Saturn again. But you can find the constellations. Um, 360 camera technology is really interesting. Um, and again, it's sort of one of those things that the fact that we can use those sensors to expose an image of the night sky and then put together a time lapse is so neat. Um, so you might see more of these uh, as time goes by, uh, especially as I can leave it out overnight. That's what I had to do for this one was leave it out overnight and go get it in the morning. <laughs> um, so maybe we can maybe we could try some more of those in the future. There's some you can do some pretty cool stuff with those cameras like uh, wait no this one. This one is just a, you know, a flat video, but you can get some really interesting angles on the sky and at, on Copernic in this case. Um, and let's see if I can speed it up a little bit. You get this sort of like tiny planet view of Copernic, which I love. I love that uh, perspective. You can do some tracking on the Milky Way with them. You can see it's not perfect. Like there are some de definite um, uh, spots on the, the sensor, um, some dead pixels and whatnot uh, from as you overexpose. And those are those are tricky and very time consuming to remove on, during, on videos like this, like time lapses. Um, on 360 images in particular, and I need to work out how to do that um, because it's possible to do it on flat frames. And theoretically, a, you can just look at a 360 image as a flat frame, um, but I'll need to really narrow down how to get rid of those uh, defects in the image because they sort of interrupt the stars um, here. You can see that it look like they just look like static stars, but they're actually defects on the sensor after long exposures. <clears throat> So this is, it's a really, really powerful tool, and we'll see if we can continue to do those. There just wasn't a, a good night um, during the winter skies here to do a long, that was still like within reasonable temperature, and I felt comfortable leaving it outside. Uh, but yeah, there's the tiny planet view. So there's, there's a lot of resources, a lot of videos like that on our channel that are, of course, you're welcome to go check out again. When I look at it, it's like, wow, we had a lot of streams this year <laughs> um, compared to, to, compared to where, we, where we were, which we didn't, the, the, our, the, the current events, uh, of course, uh, caused us to, to try this out, and uh, it's, it, it's been working well, so so far. So and I hope it, it it's something we can continue after after the fact. Oh, that's awesome, Stacy. Yeah, that's that's great. Any anything. That's a, a good point there too. Any any camera that you can take long exposures on. Perfect. Just uh, go outside, take the camera out. Try and get a time lapse of the sky, get some stars, and those those GoPros and phones, because their their focus settings, um, they're often just set to sort of an infinite focus. That, um, uh, especially the GoPros and like my 360 camera, I don't have to worry about focusing them. They're set to this infinite focus that will be that will capture pretty decent pinpoint stars without a problem, as long as it can expose them. Uh, so yeah, definitely uh, give anything that can take long exposures a try on the sky. Um, that's a, gr uh, a great idea. Uh, did I miss anything above here? Oh, gotcha. 
It was Elon Musk. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, yeah. Good conversations we're, we're having here, and I just wish we had a sky to talk against or amongst to, to check out. Yeah, the GoPros are so versatile. Really, really, like, you know, amazing how, how small the, and how good those sensors are on those cameras. Um, and like, like I said, like, and like you said, the fact that, you, that he's able to do, um, uh, night sky time lapses with it is all the better and, and really shows the versatility of it. Okay. Well, uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll, uh, close out tonight. <clears throat> Again, uh, really great presentations tonight. Um, I'm going to try to split up this footage like before. Um, so if you have someone that missed tonight, uh, we'll, we'll break up the videos like we did for AstroFest. Um, so each presentation will be uh, available separately. And uh, what else? Uh, of course, happy birthday again to, to Nikolai Kopernik. Um, we, we always uh, refer to him as the father of modern astronomy. Could not be more true. Um, so uh, we wish him wish wish him a happy birthday. <laughs> oh, okay, Nicholas, I will I will look at that. All right, uh, sounds good to me, uh, everyone. I, I, again, stay tuned for maybe some more perseverance stuff, more observing live streams. And uh, we will catch you in the next uh, program coming up soon. All right. Have a good night, everyone.